the, the crime or, or the, the things that we're going to talk about, but being here through COVID and doing something like this um, through Zoom is not something that you've always seen. Um, it's it just not, right? So I, I, I've looked at national um, different diversity officers and things that they're doing, and I'm actually going to attend one tonight where they're going to explain how we can do the work. Um, so I'm kind of, right now, Bristol and myself are kind of a little bit of ahead of how to do that and how to make it happen. So um, there might be some glitches, there might be some things that mess up, I don't know, um, but you know, please bear with us. Today's not gonna be very academia, this is a fast action forum. Um, so it's gonna be something that we're gonna speak from the heart, um, speak from our experiences, um, talk about our stories, um, you know, as we, as we move through this, try to really make sense of it. Um, what really it was powerful to me is I had a lot of you who might be on here who are friends and family, um, colleagues that, you know, that I highly respect reaching out to me and stating, how can I help? I feel small. I don't know what to do. And this is an opportunity for us to really listen. That's the first thing to do is listen. We want us to listen. And then after we listen, figure out actionable items that we can do to influence our areas, influence our circles. Um, when we speak today, it's going to, we're gonna talk about a lot of different things, but it's not going to be just strictly the incident that happened last Thursday because there has been years and years of, this is how I'm feeling with a lot of people not listening. And we need to make sure that that is not forgotten in this. Um, the act of what happened with George Floyd is extremely powerful. I, it's something that you see, but what we are saying is like, well, that's one incident, one cop, one, you know, one group, it just doesn't happen all the time. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you it, it, it happens. And sometimes you don't even realize that you know, they talk about gun violence and, and police officers. We don't realize that there's, there's plenty of people that, and we might get to a few today that went into jail or went into on, on route to jail and passed away for simple traffic stops. Those things happen in our communities. Those things have happened to people that I respect and love. Um, so it, sit, it sits home with, my, with me and many people that are here and many people throughout the world. And that's why you're seeing people really lash out in the way we are. Um, just remember in this time, it's an hour and a half. We're not, and then we'll have a little bit of time extra if you wanna speak to ex, um, experts or people that will, you know, will hang around just to talk, that is fine. I'm gonna try to keep it us to our agenda, keep us the time. I apologize. Um, we have specific rules that we did send you. You should have an agenda. The agenda will talk about the rules of what we're doing. Um, the first part of um, our, the agenda will go into the introduction. Which, um, which I'm doing currently. After the introduction, we will go into our power. Um, we will go take a moment of silence in a minute from now. After the moment of silence, we're gonna go into a brief um, power slide that's gonna just talk and show you some images and we're just gonna, I'm just gonna talk it through as we get there. And then I'm gonna share it. And then after that, we're gonna do a little exercise. Once we finish that exercise, we will then go into what's called the experience component where you um, if you are a person of color, a person who had experiences as an employee, as you know, maybe something with it might have been through uh, police uh, brutality, it could be through discrimination, it could be through anything that you've experienced, I will open it up for you to share it at that time. Then the next piece will be, and uh, um, the next half hour after that will be for individuals to make comments, questions, statements that can help you through this because I'm gonna let you know today, I'm not going to put in my feelings and try to steer you in a direction. I think when you're watching media and you're watching all of the things that we see, people want you to face one way. Our humanity should knows what's right and wrong, okay? So I want us to understand that. I'm gonna stand in the middle today because there are gonna be people that have conservative point of views. There's gonna be individuals that have very liberal point of views and that's okay because there are people that are liberal, that, that are conservative, that are not racist. And I think sometimes that a bad rap is happening and we gotta make sure that we understand that in this. There are people that are liberal that could be racist. Um, so <laughs> I think we have to really understand that we are, all, we are humans first um, before we pick a side so we're not pinning against each other, that we use forms like this in order for us to really come together as, as, as one. Because no matter what, 
things aren't changing, we're always going to be um, working with one another. Um, and that's just the nature of, of our life. And that's what makes America great, all right? Um, but we wanna make sure that it's great for everyone. There's no such thing, as, you know, there's, that's what we're looking for. Make it great for everyone that, that's here. Um, and let's learn some, let's learn um, how to, to go about all the things that we, that we are going through. Um, so first, um, before I talk about the rules, the rules make sure that um, once we get to the sections of where you are able to participate, if you have an experience and you are a person of color and would like to just take, you know, have a two minute briefing of just an experience or something, I'm going to lead the way first. So that way people are not just starting. So you can kind of follow my format and then we'll continue going through this. Once we go through that piece, um, I'm gonna play a little video for you. Um, once we play that video, um, but if you have an experience, you gotta type in experience and then I will call on you. Once I call on you, you'll be able to kind of uh, chime in and, and say what you need to say at that moment, whether it was a story or an experience. Um, then I'll play a video after that. So I, I'm sorry, I kind of went a little ahead of myself. After I tell that story, um, and you guys, not the story, but once you see the video that tells a story that from a very prominent figure in our lives, then it's going to uh, go into comments, questions, and answers. Once that happens, and you, once that happens and we go there, okay, it will go to the question comments. And I reserve that if you have a question or comment, to, we have a lot of people in here to make sure that we stay within a two minute um, briefing of what your ex comment or question is, or so that way we could get hear more and more voices, right? I don't wanna dominate today. I don't want no one else dominating today. I want us to understand that this is not just me um, and you guys are supporting. It's not just another person, it's all of us and we need to hear all these stories, okay? So, um, Right now, like for us to make sure that if you can turn on your cameras, if you're if you're able to, because I just I think it's more powerful the more that we see each other. Um, if you can't, that's fine. You got kids and things running around. That's that's absolutely fine. I under I get it. I understand. But if you're able to, then that's you know showing respect, I guess, to to those that are out there. Um, and I would love for us right now to take a moment of silence for the fallen slaves, activists, mothers fathers, brothers, sisters, cousins, aunties, uncles, friends, partners, leaders, who all died because of the color of their skin. Okay, so why are we here? So last week, unfortunately, there was an incident that we all got to witness live on TV. Um, not, you know, I mean, it wasn't, it was live to some people and then it got on, it was on television minutes after. Um, we saw and we saw it, and I think it compelled us all to be. It, we saw it, and we, it compelled us all to say, like, what the heck is going on here? People from the Black and African American communities have really spoke about these um, things that have happened, um, and you see that some people are really, behind, like, really saying that this is not. It's not good enough. It's we have to do better. Um, and we've seen that um, through a lot of the, you know, peaceful protests and a lot of the things that have gone on over the years, not just in this incident, but prior to that. Um, we're here today, and I, and I know we saw that, that incident, but we're, not, we're here today not to speak about the particular incident itself. And we're not here to talk about the, you know, how it happened or why it happened. Um, we're, we're not here about that right now. Uh, we're not here to talk about George Floyd's um, life. Um, we're not here to talk about George um, for if he's a good person or a bad person. We're here because there, 
what brought us all here today was an image. The image that you see there is one that will stick to many of you, many of you for years to come. Um, I know it will with myself. I know it does with my 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 own family, and it's and it's not it's not easy to look at. However, we want to talk about the history of these incidents and images that stick with this image is sticking with a lot of you that may not identify with me. But this image right here is, is doing that for many people now because this is something that they're seeing live and they're like, how did this happen? I wanna talk about uh, the, the history of these things and how this is not new and why we look for social justice, why positions like my position is created and why we, um, why we look to try to create change and really fight for our students. As you guys know me, I fight for my students day and, li day and night. I fight for my family, I fight, from, I fight for my son. Those are things that I do because I have to. Next image, please. Tulsa Race Massacre, 1921. If you guys recall, it's Black Wall Street, all right? Black Wall Street was a, um, a, a black community that was doing very, very well economically. It was an uprising of businesses, business owners. Um, and then in 1921, um, almost to the day, um, there was a, an incident where over 300 prominent African-American black males were killed. Um, their places were burned down. Their, their finances were taken away from them. All that they have built were just gone in one day. Next slide. The GI Bill discriminations of the 1940s, another image that sticks with a lot of people people still alive from that, from that era. The GI Bill was basically, was for our, our soldiers that are returning from war or part of our military to purchase homes throughout the course of, purchase homes and, and have that home ownership, a piece of land. Our land is your land, your land is my land, and, and really sharing that. However, that was not true for Black and African Americans um, that, that served in the military. They weren't able to take advantage of that bill at that time. Next, next, 1950s, graphic, another graphic image, Emmett Till, 1955, was so that uh, at a woman that he thought was, that was attractive, there's debate if that really happened. She came out to, uh, at, and I believe in her dying bed to say that it was false. And he was dragged, beat up, dragged by uh, a truck with a uh, full of, white males, and this is the image, the last image that his family got to see um, of Emmett. Next slide, please. Little Rock uh, Nine, um, you know, just trying to get education, crossing that barrier to go to school, just to have that right to be able to do that. These images are things that you see where, where you have military and police and people yelling and screaming at these, at the, at the people that are crossing this line in order to uh, fight for education for individuals like myself will be in position to, um, to get to be better educated. Next slide, please. Selma March of 1965, peaceful protest, something that you guys hear. Why don't we pray? Why, why aren't these protests very, very peaceful? What are people doing? Why are, why are people so angry? Why can't you see it on, online? If you're, a, if you're a member of Facebook or um, Instagram or any of social media, you've probably seen an image of saying why they can't peacefully march like MLK. Next slide. This is the same day. It's also called, it turned into the Selma March Bloody Sunday. So they show an image of him peacefully marching, but the images that you're not seeing is this is the result of that peaceful march. People dressed to the nines in that first picture, right? People dressed to the nines, they're ready for everything to, to go well. And then next thing you know, um, they, they, they have American flags up that they, this is our country. And then this is the result. Next picture. The Rots riots of 1965, turning point because they were, they, were, they were getting pulled over and police way too much. And then people had to uprise and then there was a March riots. Next picture. Then obviously the assassination of, of MLK in 1968, where here's our, one of our greatest world leaders to ever 
um, touched this earth was just taken out because of the thing, the justice, the prevailing, the unity that he wanted to create. Next slide. Close to home, Boston, the you know, busing desegregation protests of 1976. Here's an iconic picture. All of a sudden brawls are starting. This man has an American flag and he's targeting an African-American with it because he is not American according, according to this person. Next slide. Then here's other type of images. So we see the protest images and things like that, but just imagine yourself right now as a black boy, black child, right? Um, uh, uh, black woman, right? And these are the images that you see. The Anti-Abuse Act, a War on Drugs of 1986, where you're just seeing men of color being arrested all the time. And, and, and for you know, things that are illegal today, they were being arrested for at high rates. Next slide. Central, Central Park Five, which I call the Exonerated Five. Five young boys from ages 11 to 16 were arrested for uh, accused of raping a, a, a jogger. It later was found that, he, that they did not do it. However, they were also persecuted. They were, there was ads that were taken out in, um, by actually our, our current president in the New York Times that these, that these individuals should be, um, go to jail for life or get the, uh, the, uh, the electric chair. And these individuals stayed years upon years, I think all the way up to like you know, almost 20 years for one of them in jail. Now they're called the exonerated five because they found the person who actually did the crime. Um, also in this picture, which you don't see is that when they were um, interviewed by police officers without parents being there, and obviously young scared kids are going to comply. That's what they did after, com after they were complicit and, and with, the, with the authorities, they end up um, going to jail for a very long time. Next slide, please. Rodney King riot, 1992. First time, this is epic. First time something was caught live happening. A person had a camera and just went. And then people were looking at Rodney King get beat up. And then after Rodney King was um, being beat up um, badly, he, um, the riot started again in, in LA. And remember when Rodney King was on, if you're old enough to remember this, when Rodney King was on, um, when Rodney King was on video after um, an interview with, uh, with one of the news stations, he, he, he said, um, he said uh, why can't we all just get along? And he just didn't understand what happened. Next one, please. Here's, a, here's a, something that's interesting here, the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994. Um, and then we look at the likelihood of the, the raising of prison, uh, imprisonment uh, for individuals born in 2001. And as you can see in this graphic, all men are one in nine to be arrested. Uh, white men, one in 17. Black men, one in three are to be arrested. Um, and the Latino men are one in six. And as you look at the women graphic on the bottom, uh, black women are highly likely to be arrested more so um, than any other um, woman um, that there, any other woman race that's out there. Um, part, I, I don't have that the data with us, but I did read on something that stated that the reason why black women are at a higher rate as well is because sometimes if it's, you know, they are um, pressured and pushed because they are trying to get um, accusations out of them because they are trying to penalize the male, um, their male counterparts um, for, you know, so it might be a husband or, or boyfriend or for whatever reason it may be. I will be able to send some of you guys of that information in later in the later time. Next one, please. Then we look at the increase of stop and frisk in the, in the 2000s. So just imagine just being, you know, like a, a, a men of color, anywhere from the ages of 13 to 35, more than likely you're walking down the street and the cops had the right, this is in New York, had the right to just pull you over and to start searching you to look for things. Well, I know if you search most of people in America, you're going to find things, whether it's a, 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 you know, a weapon, whether it's a, a bag of weed, whether it's, you know, I don't know, a counterfeit bill, I don't know what it is. You're going to find something if you're really trying to look at it, if you're stopping everyone. However, this was only, um, only pertained to black males and black males suffered um, through this and were constantly being pulled over, harassed. So this is an image that they're, remember, this is an image that they're collecting, pulled over, harassed in 
um, and then some of them are going to jail. Um, but most of the time they weren't going to jail, but the damage is done because some people will be um, pulled over multiple times. Next slide. Then some of the current things, Trey, uh, Trayvon Martin, don't have, you know, walking home, RIP. Next one. Sandra Bland pulled over, RIP. Michael Brown was walking into the street, regardless of what people say about his character, didn't have a weapon with him, RIP. Imagine being a 12 year old kid and going into, and going to a park to play. And as you're in a park and you're, you're playing and you have a toy gun, a police officer doesn't roll from the streets, they roll in their car and shoot you from their car because they saw you with a toy gun. Uh, Tamir Rice, RIP. Freddie Gray pulled over on his bike, cops beat him up. He goes in the back of a paddy wagon. Freddie Gray comes out, no more Freddie Gray, RIP. Eric Gardner selling loose cigarettes. The first person that you may have heard on, on camera saying, I can't breathe was, um, was, you know, pretty deep. And then all of a sudden, here's a man trying to make money for his family and he died. Next one. So I know Castile, if you haven't seen the video, um, pulled over, um, there was a record that he was pulled over um, 40 something times without, but only a few things that ac actually stuck as far as tickets. So for whatever reason, he was always being pulled over. He did have his, um, he did have his, uh, he did have a license to carry. Um, as he went to go get his wallet, he was uh, shot and killed in front of his girlfriend and his mother. I mean, girlfriend and, and her mother, girlfriend and his and her daughter. Um, and if you haven't seen that conversation between the daughter and the mother in the back of the police car after the shooting, it is powerful. I suggest you watch it if you ever have time. Next one, please. Both Sam Jean in his house sitting, a uh, police officer knocks over, the, um, breaks in and shoots him in his own apartment, confusing it with her apartment. Next one. Brianna Taylor, a um, couple of weeks ago was in her house. There was a warrant, they went to the wrong house. Um, they quickly went to defend themselves. Um, they had license to carry to defend themselves. As you can see, she is a public servant and she was caught, shot and killed. And right now her, um, I'm not sure, I haven't updated it, but her boyfriend who did shoot at police officers um, is now um, have many charges that they filed against them uh, for, for whatever reason. Next one, Ahmad Aubrey jogging, rest in peace. We saw that. And then where we are today with George Floyd, um, regardless of the, you know, he had a counterfeit bill. We don't know the whole story. Went into a store, seemed compliant, and he passed away um, violently. Next slide, please. And this is the image that we have. We saw that. Next slide. A lot of these things didn't have any conviction, so that's a problem that we that that's there, and that's probably where people are a little bit more upset. We understand that um, you know that there are jobs that are out there that are very very tough as far as being law enforcement and military. We get it. However, when people do act out, we have to we wonder why there's not enough um, convictions. Next slide, please. Then there's other things that happen. Other images that stick with us. So again, you know, sleeping while black and you're a Yale student, I guess if you're a Yale student, you can't sleep and, and then police were called because it wasn't true that she was a, um, that she wasn't a, uh, a student there. Next one, please. How about if you, you know, we see, we see our kids all the time selling, um, <laughs> selling lemonade, right, on the, on the corners, right? I used to do it. Um, this, this beautiful young child was selling a, um, was selling um, water and this is you know it's funny we call a permit patty but lady stood up and said do you have a permit and police were called next slide how about barbecuing barbecue Becky that's funny but it's still again family trying to enjoy themselves peacefully and they get the cops pulled called on them next one Amy Cooper and and Christian Cooper this last week I mean Christian Cooper is an avid um, is an avid bird watcher as this man is a bird watcher he um, told her peacefully, can you please leash your dog? As you see the way she handled her dog, she's not very apt to doing that, it seemed, because um, he didn't want the dog to damage uh, or hurt any of the um, wild um, animals. It's a pretty simple thing to ask. She repeated that, um, called the police on him, repeated that he's an African-American big uh, um, guy uh, several times, which was, um, 
uh, her and in, 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 you know trying to really push her fear um, to the to the dispatcher so that way police will be dispersed um, to the area. Next one. And then we've seen protests with Colin Kaepernick. We know about the story of taking a knee. This is an iconic picture because you see, you know, they use this one a lot because he's kneeling. But in the back, you have the servant, um, a public servant who is, you know, who has all right to to salute the flag that way. I do, and I agree with it as well. But you can see this is a peaceful component that um, at first Kaepernick sat down on the bench, and as he sat down on the bench, he spoke to military people that said, "Look, our fallen brothers, we take a knee." This knee that he's taken is for fallen people of color, um, the same people that we've just watched, um, and we are very confused about their, um, about their, their, their murders or their why they're not here on Earth anymore. Next one. And then you know this is kind of playing on with the skirt right by it, but this is you know if if Kaepernick's way is not um, good, then it, this is a funny thing I saw online. Like, but none of these seem to be a way to protest. Next one. And now we go through experiences. So, um, so I kind of went through that real quick, and I, I want to kind of get through a couple of experiences really, really fast for us, okay? Um, and I want you to kind of take your take yourself into a place. You can take that down, Melissa. So you don't have to have that up there if you don't want to. So, what I want us to do in this exercise, um, and then we'll get into people talking about their experiences and getting there. What I would like for us to do right now is I want you, if you can, and you're able to, um, I would like for you to close your eyes and, as I take you through a story, okay? And the story is this. I want you to put yourself back to when you're 15 years old. Um, some of you might already be 15 years old, so just you know, take you back to freshman year in high school, whatever that age is. So you're a freshman in high school, you are having fun, and you actually attend a high school event, um, whether it be a school dance, um, a football game, basketball game, uh, whatever club it is. And it's at night, it, you know, and it's, you're having a, the best time of your life. As you're having the best time in your life and you're doing that, you, you, you think about your best friend. Think about whoever your best friend was at that time. It doesn't matter if you're friends with them now. If you want to put it, make it more relevant, think about a friend who you care about right now that is with you. You guys are, the, the party is, you know, or the event is halfway done. There's a corner store across the street. The corner store across the street is, you, know, you go there all the time. This is not the first time that you've done it. You and your friend walk to the corner store. As you start walking to the corner store, all of a sudden, a ton of police cars swarm in and they're, they're coming from all over the place. Maybe five, six, seven police cars. Guns are drawn to you. They tell you to get on the ground. They jump on you. You have no idea what, what's going on. They step on your, on your back and then you have a gun put to the back of your, um, like not your, quite your, your neck, but kind of right in the middle there. Asking you questions about why are you here? Who are you? And you state that you're going to that school. You go to the school that's really literally right there. You can see the school. That's my school. And then that person tells you, that's not your school. I know people that work there. And you say to them, no, I know people that work there too. You're, you're being very, very compliant and you, you, you do everything that you can. And then you're, you're scared, your friend is scared. Your friend now is starting to get a, a little, little lippy because your friend is on one knee. He's not on the ground facing like how you are, um, but they have you down on the ground. And the description was just a general description. So if you're a person, you know, whatever you, whatever you are, Let's say the description wasn't detailed, but it was just of the color of your skin and your height. Okay. Now people from that people from that school come running out to see what's going on, including the principal, including people, and they say, and they say, what's going on here? And like, we had a description of a break-in, and this is the uh, this um, this man fits um, the description, or a woman. It, you know, again, you're placing yourself there. And then that person then, you know, the principal then says, absolutely not. This person has been in with us all night here at the party, has not, has not left us. Um, and he's, he's a good kid and he's only a freshman or she's only a freshman. The police then says, sorry. They put their guns away and they let you go. Now you're distraught. You call it, you know, you have to call your mom or your parent or loved one or whoever it may be. 
and the rest of your night is ruined, but it's something that lasts with you. Can you guys, one more, one more, now I'll give you a, a second quick scenario. And that was at age 15. So now put yourself at age 17, you're driving, you're in McDonald's parking lot, you're sitting down at McDonald's, you're, 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 you're having, you know, you're whips a couple of friends in their car, um, an officer knocks on the window, the friends in your car are different from you. So whatever that is, so put yourself there, they're, they're different from you. So I just want to put you in that scenario. As they're different from you, all of a sudden the, cop, the police officer, um, uh, this one is a, a state trooper now, says, um, you know, what are you guys doing? Your, your registration or is expired. That's why I, I stopped you. Now you're in the McDonald's parking lot. You, had, you went into a drive through and you bought the food. Um, so you're sitting there, but you're in the back of the car. Your car is next to them, so they tell you to leave. I'm like, okay, I'll leave. The pe now remember, the people in the front car of the car are similar to you, okay? And then all of a sudden, as they're similar to you, I mean, that's, they're different from you, I'm sorry. You go into the car, your car, you start warming up your car. They bang on the window, say, why haven't you left yet? I'm like, I'm just warming up my car. I'll, I'll leave in a second. I, and, but you do say, I have every right to be here. Next thing you know, the cop gets agitated because you didn't leave fast enough, opens up your cars, grabs you by, grab you by, your, um, grabs you by your, your jacket, you push his hand away, he says you're under, weight, under arrest, you say, for what? You have no idea what's going on. Next thing you know, you're in the back of a squad car and you're going to jail. And, you're, and you go, now the next day, your mom, mother's crying, you're in court, you have no idea what's going on, and you get all these charges that are brought up on, uh, against you. However, luckily, nothing was, nothing, was, nothing was found or came about it because people in that parking lot at that time, as you had guns drawn to you, started um, yelling at the individual. EMTs were in there, other people, um, other public servants were in there, and they were protecting you. And they stated to themselves, like, hey, this, it, this is wrong. And then I think that, you know, and I think it persuaded the officer just to arrest you. And then they brought you. And then when they found out that, you know, you were younger than what was perceived, all of a sudden, things um, changed and the tone changed. However, you still brought up charges. All charges were dropped because nothing really happened and you got an apology from the letter. However, before that letter, you were in the court office, um, courthouse with your mother. And at that time, believe it or not, with the magistrate, the, um, the, um, the judge asked the, ju um, asked the officer, what would you like to see happen here? And not being desensitized to whatever is going on, that person says, you have to be hung. Uh, I would like to see a uh, public hanging, which pissed off the judge immediately. And a letter was immediately written to me, an apology from that person. But that person never lost their job or, or that person never lost their job. Last one, you, real quick, this one takes two seconds. Imagine you're having a bad day in school. Again, you're a freshman. You're walking into class. You had you're a little rough morning with your mom. and you sit down. As you sit down and you go through the front of, and you sit down in class, um, you put your head down and your teacher says, well, you know, want to talk about it? And you said no, and you're just a little upset, but you just need a couple minutes to cool off. And then instead of a counselor being called for you, you look up and it's actually your police officers and security um, looking to take you down to go talk about what's going on versus a different protocol. Now, if you open up your eyes, and so these, the examples that I, just, that I just spoke about, these are examples that myself and my son have experienced. The last one is from him, but he has not experienced some of the gruesome things that I've worked with or things that I've dealt with as, as, a, as a man. Some of those two events that, you, that I visually took you through are events that are alive through me, and they're not the only ones. Now, again, I don't want to make this be a, uh, I want this to make clear as I talk about my experience. This is not to bombard police officers and to say that they're bad, because I have tons of police officers that are my friends that are close friends of mine and people I work with, okay? I know the examples went that way, but it's also, but I also sold you examples of people calling the police and inciting fear because of maybe me and my size and stature. And I wanted you to put yourself in that place so you had an understanding of what that is. Everything that we do and everything I do as a parent, okay, and everything I do as a, as I've been a coach, right? So I, I represent not just, you know, Black and African, American and Latinx males for over 20 years, which I care about, 
I also, um, uh, you know, white males that have been on my team and I care about them and we call each other family. So it's not just represent representation to there. I'm also a director of multicultural affairs. There's so many students that come to me for these things because they are experiencing this. This is my son. He's experienced not what I have. I'm trying to keep him away from that. But it's hard to not do it because these images that are in my head resonate with me and they, are, they stay with me. And now I'm trying to make sure we push this narrative because every time, you know, he's going to be driving soon. So the next question I'm going to have is, you know, how do, what do you say? Where is your registration? And I don't want him to be in fear, but it's, these are thoughts that go through my, that go through my mind. And this is why we're having this program today so we can kind of resonate with one another in order to make change, to create things and to influence our little circles that we can. So we'll go into some of our experiences um, right now. So I had one that was a private message, um, but it just said experience. Um, Doris, is that, are you, um, want to keep it, I mean, I, there was nothing written privately. So some of you, if you guys are doing something privately, send it to me and I can talk about it. If it's not, if you just want to experience that's out there, that's fine as well. But Melissa, you can unmute and you guys can mute as we go along. Okay, I can share. So um, as I watched the events over this past week, several things came to mind. Um, one, that I find that our black men are being killed for the minor incidents. So I worked at the Fed, and I am one of those who used to call the police on people who brought me fake money, whether it was 20s, 100s, 5s, whatever. When the police would show up, they would actually take the person by the elbow and take them to a room, never trying to kill them for a fake dollar bill. The fake dollar bill what they really want to know is one, where did you get it? Did you print it? Um, who gave it to you? And try and track it back because it is a crime for passing fake money. But in this incident, it does not require you to lose your life. The same thing with New York. A singleton cigarette, he didn't kill anybody. I see people on the side of the road, when they pull us over for a traffic stop, they will call for backup. And it is usually two, three, four police officers. I had this conversation with the girl at um, physical therapy this morning. She goes, why? Why do they call for, I said, sweetie, that's all the time. If it is two police, they call for backup. It could be four police officers for one black person. And then if you ride past the white person, they're sitting on the ground in handcuffs and the officer is lighting their cigarette. They're not on their backs. So we get killed for reasons that don't need to be. And it's awful. I've been stopped. When I'm stopped, they call back up for me. Here's two police officers trying to arrest me. Arrest me for what? I was in a neighborhood that I had just moved into, didn't know my way, but they said I was speeding. No, because I don't even know where I'm at. Here's another one. I'm also called Looky Lou. I go through open houses all the time. So when I'm looking at Ahmed Aubrey, and he's jogging through this house that's not finished, and then they head him off and then kill him. I'm going, are you serious? That could be me. I'm always in, in houses that are being built, trying to see what they're doing. So these incidents are not uh, just this once. This is our entire life. Like Rob said, my brother, we were on our way to the store, went to get bread and milk as a kid, 13, 14. We stopped at this car that was burnt out in the alley. Just nosy little kids. Here come the police saying that my brother, who's 13, stole the car and burnt the car out. They arrest him and take him to the police station. These incidents aren't new. This is our life every day. My brothers, my sisters, my, my nephews. So I, I, I try to get you to understand it. 
is when we tell you these things are happening, most of you don't believe us. Oh, that didn't happen to you. Yes, it did. Doing the 67 riots, I'm in my house, shooting down the streets with, in a tank in front of my house. I'm peeking out the window, I'm like 14, looking over the seal, watching this tank fire down my street. I got into an argument with another white lady who told me, that didn't happen in your neighborhood. I'm going like, really? I'm scared shitless. And I'm going like, okay, took everything I had not to try and lose my cool with this particular lady. But this is our life. It hasn't changed. But now is the time to change it. This is a, feels different. This is a time for us to uh, make changes, change the laws, um, look at our essential personnel, because our essential personnel should be making more than $15 an hour. And they're not us. They're not accountants. And I'm speaking for myself. They're not accountants. They are the grocery store workers. People that's working in the meat plants. We need food. We need toilet paper. Things that are necessary. So we have to think about what it is or what dynamics we can do to change this going forward and make it a better place than it has been in the past. Thank you so much, Doris. Um, Mike Oxbone, you have an experience to share? That's fine. We'll, um, we'll actually go. Shanna Howell, you have an experience to share? Uh, hello, everyone. I apologize. I'm in my car and driving to drop my son off. Um, but um, can we maybe have one or two people go and then let me see if I can get yeah. dropped off? Absolutely. Um, Marcus, you have an experience to share? Yes, hi, my. Just want to greet my Bristol family. Um, I just want to say that my experience, it is, it is negative, but uh, the purpose of me sharing the story is the points of accountability. And the fact that I was born and raised in New Bedford and to have this situation happen to you right in my backyard driving on 195 East, got pulled over by Stady right before the Fairhaven exit. I'm gonna have my music going. Next thing you know, the lights come on, pull over, gun drawn, gun already drawn at my window. So just imagine this, you turn and you're looking down a barrel of a gun, yelling for me to hands up, open the door, yanked out, Middle rush hour, about four o'clock, slammed on the trunk of my car, gun jammed into my back, ask if I have any, any weapons, drugs, any paraphernalia, anything, had me spread, spread eagle all on the trunk of my car, told me not to move whatsoever, illegally searched my car, and comes back, has me stand up and says, really no explanation, oh, you fit the description of someone I was looking for. Have a nice day. That's from that day on. That's like the trauma. Still to this day. When I'm driving on that 24 or the 93 or the 195 or the 95. When I see those cops on the side of the road. I wonder, are they gonna come follow me? I've been pulled over many times for DWBs. People who understand what a DWB is, they hear DUIs and DWB, driving wide black. That I've been a victim of. And I just want people to understand, just visualize, we just want people to, it's just every day where you, you're violated. And it's just, it just should not be that way. And that's why now I have a 12 year old son and now getting ready for him. And now I have to really preach self-awareness because you don't know. And I have cops in my family as well. But however, I should not have to live day to day and go out about running my errands and wonder if I see a law enforcement car hiding out on the side looking for speeders or just driving behind me, are they going to pull me over just cuts? And am I going to have that same negative experience that I have right in my backyard? 
And the last thing I just want to say is going forward, we just need to have fairness across the board. Fairness across the board. And as a young black professional, I've, I've come a long way, but I want to get to the point where I can go about my business and not have to do two things. One, wear a mask. And the metaphor of wearing a mask is when I go out into the professional or go out in the community, I have to behave a certain way because I'm not sure if other people are going to feel threatened by me. And then when I come back into my home, I take my mask off. The second component is one of my, one of my favorite comedians who had, who was brought to civil rights. He said this, uh, he, he always had this quote about race. And when this can go away, this one I feel like just progress. And that is complexion, when you have that complexion for the protection for the collection. And when that, and when that can go away, that's when I know that's progress. So I thank you everyone for listening and I'm done. Thank you for that, it's powerful. TJ, one of our students here at Bristol. Hi. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I don't, I have like, I have many like individual experiences, but you know, I've, I sort of had like a, a culmination of experiences going to, um, or going through the independent school system. Um, from fourth grade, I started at Friends Academy in Dartmouth and, um, you know, I have, stories from every year up until eighth grade of just little instances here and there of of racial remarks and you know just these little situations that happen I remember specifically one time I was in I was in the fifth grade and um and this kid like I had been I we had we had been friends for the for the past year we had um gone along since I had been at the school just out of nowhere it calls me an African scumbag at recess one time and that like that was like my first like real experience where I was just like where like it hit me a little bit different where someone that I consider to be my friend just you know came at me with a yeah. with a very blunt racial slur and um since like since that moment it really it really opened my eyes to you know what what goes on behind behind closed doors you know and being at that school the only the only other african americans um other than myself were my brother my sister um my dad who worked at the school and um and one of the librarians um so it was just it was just always this constant this constant question of you know what are those what are those conversations that they're having with their parents about that black kid in their class you know and um you know it definitely didn't go anywhere going into into high school um i went to st andrews first um where i i received more um more of this from from teachers who would just sort of sort of push me off when I would I would go for extra help for my classes and they sort of wouldn't take me seriously but you know students who didn't maybe didn't look like me in my class who had the same questions were met with the utmost care and and concern um, and you know it's just, it was just just little things like that and it wasn't really until my the end of my high school career that I really began to learn the history behind where a lot of it stems from and I think that anyone who really cares about the situation has done some pretty extensive digging into the history behind it because there's a lot a lot of of history um, behind this that I think that 
isn't really being brought into light with um, everything that's going on right now. But um, yeah. No, thank you. Uh, thank you, um, TJ. And, and it's very, very important because what you said there is extremely important because sometimes you're young, you don't know where this stuff is coming from. And then all of a sudden you get hit with it. And now you're, you know, you're too young to figure it out, figure out what the heck is going on here and why would this person that you care for um, would say this about you. And um, it's very, very powerful what you just said. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Adisa, are you here? If not, I know you had, you sent me it and I, I'm actually pulling it up. Um, I don't know if, she, are you here? I'm here. Okay. You can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. I'm not a great public speaker, so I wrote what I wanted to say uh, because I want my, my, my story, you know, um, to be heard. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Adis. I work for the New Bedford campus. Um, I'm a, a staff member there. And today I just wanted to share some of my experience here in the United States. Um, I came here about 23 years ago from East Africa, um, such of better opportunities and peace. Prior to arriving in the state, I lived in civil war. I lived in major famine and drought that took the lives of so many people. I survived both and I had the opportunity to come here. However, upon my arrival, I learned very quickly that America, America was not what I thought should be or seen on TV. My high school was the worst. I went to high school in Maine. The school had two cafeterias, um, one for white students, the other for all other minorities. Several times we were told by our white colleagues or white um, classmates to go back to where we came from. My second year in college was my first year interaction with police officers. It was summer of 2002. My friend and I were driving in downtown Portland, Maine. There were about three police officers parked their car on a main street with their driver's side door wide open. They were just standing and chatting. They didn't seem to be concerned that their door being left open on a busy, narrow street was a problem. One of my friends said, while well, they were leaving their door open like that, all of a sudden, I hear the three to five police officers screaming, what did you say? What did you say? Pull over, pull over, honestly, and with your gun out. <clears throat> there was no room to pull, to pull over for me as a driver. I have to drive past the traffic light to, in order to pull over. One of the passengers was my friend Ali, a black Asian man who grew up in Miami. He continued to apologize to the officer. He continued to say that we were so sorry. We didn't say anything wrong. He continued to say this, was ne this will never happen again. At that moment, I realized that Ali was apologizing to the officers for our existence. Eventually, they let us go. My second interaction with police officer was in 2004. My male friend, who is my husband now, traveled to Spain for spring break, just like so many college students. And our way, and our way back, upon arrival to Logan Airport, myself and three other Middle Eastern were pulled to a side. I was a green card holder at the time. That's what my immigration status was. My first reaction was, oh, they were going to take my green card away. A Homeland Security officer comes and he starts to ask many personal questions. He asked why I traveled to Spain. What did I do when I was there? Who did I see? How long I stayed? Who did I travel with? What do I do for a living? What college do I attend? What am I studying at a college? Why did I choose the major that I have chosen to study? How long have I been as a student? I answered all the questions with no problems because after all, I was only a green card holder. What right did I have to be questioning a Homeland officer? He told me to sit. Another female officer comes, she asked the same question and she said I was clean and free to go. However, on my way to exit, another officer stops my friend who's my husband now 
they start to ask him how long he has known me, where we met, and how we met. I know they knew I had not committed any crime because they already screened my name and my fingerprint. As a young person at the time and as a green card holder, I didn't think I had any right to be asking any officer. Those are just a few, many of my experience and the experience of many of my friends and family. There's more, but I'll just keep it brief. I was told once, once I joined the workforce, I was told by so, I was told so many things. I'll share some of them that stood out the most to me. A few years, a few years ago, I was told by one of my colleagues that I should not complain or worry too much about the cold weather because by the time the President of the United States gets to me, I'll be in my country. At a doctor's office, I was asked by an ultrasound technician how I got to this country. She asked if I sneaked to the country illegally. And I felt like saying, no, I swim all the way from America to, from Africa to America, but I just let her go. Instead, I asked her, you know, where she was from. She went on to say she was from the South where there are a lot of KKKs and she does not understand why people can't get along. I was asked by a white woman why I was participating in a women's march. What have I been denied for? My response to her was that my, your experience as a white woman is not my experience as a white, as a black woman. So I shared this story, not for you guys to feel sympathy for me, because I don't sympathize with myself. I'm the type of person I keep my heads up and I continue to go to work and smile every day and do the best to the best of my ability, uh, whether it's a job at a community. But I want to I share this so that you guys can open your mind, open your hearts, and try to see past beyond someone's skin color. We all are humans trying to do our best, just trying to live life in peace. And thank you for listening. Well said, uh, well said, Adis. I uh, appreciate that comment, that your, your story and some of your experiences. Uh, Cochise? Yes, good afternoon, Rob. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, well, good afternoon, Bristol community. I, I just want to say hello to everyone. Also, I want to acknowledge you, Rob, and Melissa for doing an outstanding job. Um, thank you for this forum. And I say that because, you know, race is a very sensitive topic. And many people don't want to talk about it. You know, we have the tendency to sweep it underneath a rug. And when you do so, there's an accumulation of filth. And eventually, you have to address it. So I'm just going to be relatively brief. My family and I, we moved to Foxborough over a decade ago in a predominantly white, affluent community. And I'm an athlete, a former athlete. I do a lot of running, I do like a lot of sprinting. And in the mornings, I would get up early to go running and jogging. And every time I would go to work out, a patrol car would come right near me and just watch me. And I share this experience because people have to understand that African Americans are treated differently compared to my white counterparts, particularly African-American males. Because if you are a large African-American male, like myself, six feet three, 250 pounds, people look at you differently and they treat you in a very, very negative manner. Not all the time. So people always ask me, why do you dress the way you do in terms of wearing suits? I dress the way I do to command respect, but I shouldn't have to be forced to wear a suit every day to command respect because if my white counterpart is dressed down, automatically he or she will get the respect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Coach I appreciate that. Shanna, um, actually, before Shanna goes, 
We're going to be transitioning right after Shanna into the next piece of it. Anybody that does have experiences, um, when we get to the the open uh, uh, open half hour at the end, you can share some of those experiences there. But I just want to be cautious of people's time as well. Um, unfortunately, this is so powerful. We can go hours and hours, but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be cautious of everybody's uh, time here as well. Um, Shanna? Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Shanna Howell. I'm the Dean of the New Bedford Campus. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about my experience. For those of you who do not know, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts, but I was raised in Atlanta, the south side of Atlanta. Um, you ever heard, of, ever heard of people talking about College Park? Um, that's the area that I grew up in. Um, growing up, before I just tell you my experiences, I wanted to give you a little background. Growing up um, in the South, um, there were a lot of prominent African Americans that I looked up to. And what I realized that they all had in common is that they had education. And so for me, I thought that education was going to be my key to being successful, um, my key to a better life. And so I was um, encouraged by a lot of teachers growing up and principals that I need to go to college. I was First, my family to go to college is Jackie with a PhD. Kind of having a little bit of difficulty. Hopefully, you might be in a rest. Uh, I stand here now. Yep, we can hear you now. Okay. Um, I was saying in 2020, I, here I am with a PhD. Here I am, somewhat successful, but no matter where I go, I still have fear. And I want to talk about fear for a second. The fear that African American and Black Americans have is just automatic. It's not a something that you're taught. It's just something that you grow to know and feel. When I go and go shopping, I've I've lived in Massachusetts, I lived in Georgia, and I lived in Iowa. And I have I can tell you multiple incidents of situations where I was just, I was discriminated against because of the color of my skin. These people don't know I have a PhD. They don't know I'm successful in my career. They just see me as a black woman and wonder what I'm doing in their store. And I just moved here in August, and I've already had one day at a mall. It's because you live in a particular state. It happens everywhere. But the one incident that I want to talk about, and I'm going to go ahead, and I shouldn't have to do this, but I want to apologize because some of the language I'm about to use. Um, in 2007, my ex-husband and I moved to Iowa, and I worked at Drake University, which is a private school that is pretty, um, uh, uh, has, has a high esteem for a lot of people. Um, one Sunday, we were driving to visit one of the coaches on the team, him and his wife and his family. And they live in a predominantly white neighborhood, and they were are a black family. We were pulled over. Um, on the way to their house. We were not speeding because we knew in this area, as a black person, you should not speed, that you need to be very precautious when you drive to this particular city. We were pulled over, and the police, when asked what was the problem, the first thing that the police officer said is, why are you all out here? No niggers live out here. I didn't say the N-word because that's not what was said to us. They said no niggers live out here. And my ex-husband proceeded to tell them that this is my wife. She works at Drake University in the athletic department. And we're going to see, and he named the coach because everybody knew the coach. And the police officer said, oh, yeah, I forgot that nigger lived here. Once he ran the license and everything was clear, he let us go. At that point in my life, I've never trembled. I literally was shaking because they thought anything could happen. And so I tell my white brothers and my white sisters, I, I put a post on my Facebook today. What I ask of you in all of this is you have to be a voice. All my friends are saying, Shanna, what can I do? This is what I ask you. If you have family members, if you have friends who are talking, inappropriately about black people, they're using the N-word, if they're if they're saying things like they need to go back to Africa, 
if you sit there and don't say anything, you're still part of the problem. So I'm asking you to be a voice. That's your opportunity. No, you may not go march. May, no, you may not um, have other avenues, but you have to be a voice in your own family and around your own friends. And that's all I have to say. No, thank you, Shanna. This is extremely powerful. Um, as um, Melissa, you're going to upload this next video. I want to share something that was just on um, my Facebook that I shared um, and something that was written. And this is the problem because even people that are close to you, they try to fight and not really listen. And this person is not particularly close, but I'm close with a family. I'm not going to say their name. You can go on my Facebook and see. But this was the comment that was just left on my um, was just left on my on my board and I uh, people text me so I had to look at it and it says Rob Are you familiar with George Floyd who George Floyd was? Are you educated on the facts of the case? I know that you're out here preaching like the Messiah But would you research before you continue to claim a false king? And that was written by somebody who doesn't look like us like me to, and and looking at the character, trying to define the character of maybe some of George Floyd's past. If you, it, it's it's extreme. It's ex extreme when people do these things, and this happens quite often. People want to debate, and they want to kind of decriminalize you. And the one thing I always go to people, and I say, if that day that I, that story I shared to you, if I moved the wrong way and they shot me in the back of either one of those two incidents, they shot me or they shot uh, Marcus Christopher, who talked about the guns being drawn. Now it's left to the regular public and for people that are out there to speak about me. Now my mother and everyone would be hurt about my life and who I am, but there might be, let's say there is a charge. You know, let's say, let's say I'm fortunate enough and I, that day that I got, I got arrested, uh, not arrested, the day that I got, um, when I'm walking outside of my school and they took me in because my principal didn't come out. And they, they put a little misdemeanor and I went through probation. And then all of a sudden, two years later, fast forward, I'm in the back of McDonald's, a uh, scrummage ha happens, and next thing you know, I get shot and killed. What do you think the reports are going to be from people? The reports are going to be that this person had a history. He is not a good person. Why would you guys defend this individual? That's what we, are, as, 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 especially black males, this is what we're trying. We're trying to say, like, this, is, this narrative of some of these things that are trying to get out there really is not, it's really not what, you, what we are. And I think the problem is, is a lot of times we are seen and we're trying to be, we're, we're seen differently and people want to try to really, the, you know, really take away who our, what our character is. And then we have to do what's called code switching, which a lot of times we are pretending at times we can't really feel to be ourselves because we have this in the back of our mind and maybe it's our own imprisonment, but this is where we ask our brothers and sisters who don't look like us to help us get through that and not to have this, this, this you know, because we, we feel this way because it seems like we're always in these situations and it has not changed. I showed us a timeline of a hundred years today, hundred years. It's continuously happened and it always happens. It just changes and goes into a different form. The new form now is how people will respond to you on Facebook and say something, they're your friends, but they're sitting here and they want to have a debate and then call you um, names like you're a messiah. I'm not a messiah. What I am is I'm a representation of the young men that look like my son because there are people out there like that that will try to, try to bring, us, bring individuals that are beautiful like him down. And that cannot happen and I cannot allow that to happen. But those things happen daily. If you see those things, if, if you have a, a, an area to influence, and we'll talk about that in a minute when we get to our, our tactics, um, I just wanted to share that with everyone. Uh, go ahead, Melissa. Oops. Maybe unmute. Are you muted, Melissa? No, I'm not. Can you not hear it? No, we can't hear it. Try it one more time. If not, we can. I, we can send a video. Try to restart it one more time, see if we can get it. Turn the volume up. I heard a little bit of it. Yeah, turn the volume up. Yeah, it's at full, um, it's at full strength. Okay. 
so what I'll do here, I will just transition. Um, I mean, we're, we're trying to make sure we, we're cautious of everyone's time. We'll send this to you. But in this video is just MLK talking about the voice of the unheard is, called, is, is, is rioting. Um, and that's coming from a man who is extremely powerful, who's peaceful, who has done everything. But it, it, it kind of resonated with me because right, you know, as we start talking about these things and we start unpacking stuff, we're gonna talk about why are people rioting? Why are people looting? What is going on? And those are the things that you hear a lot, but it's one of those, it, it's a scenario where people are, are, are tired. Um, it, it, they're tired and, and they're like, no one hears us. No one's changing laws and no one's doing things to really protect us. Um, we just must abide by these traditional laws that do not fit untraditional people that are not native that that are native to the land because they were brought here, but nothing was ever brought um, forward for that for us to feel that we can walk the streets, ride our cars, go into a restaurant or a store, and feel that we're we're at peace when doing it. I mean, think about a lot. Think about it right now. I mean, there's 40 million Black Americans in the world, and you guys who are identify as my brothers and sisters that are white. You go to a lot of restaurants and you only see a couple of couples there that are black. Is it because we have our own restaurants? No, it's because we, a lot of people don't, they don't want to, they don't trust it. They're not trusting. They don't want to be there. And that's, not, and that's a terrible place to live in your mind. Um, not everyone can be like myself and others who just don't care and will be there. There's a lot that just stay away. Um, so the next part right here is just the um, comments, questions. If you have a comment, please write into the thing. If you have a comment or you want to say something, um, let's go ahead and do that. And then we can kind of go from there. Um, there was some other stuff that was written in here. Um, and from people from, you know, Jay and, and Kathleen, there's some great stuff. Um, there's some from Deb, there's some great stuff in there. Um, stuff that they wrote on Facebook. So look at that. Um, but if you do have a comment, we'll start there. Um, First, um, uh, first comment is Diana. Actually, it's uh, Jerry LePage. Oh, is it? I'm sorry. Yep. That's yeah. okay. I got, I got it. I'm trying to do three things at once. So sorry. No, Go ahead, Jerry. We're, we're sharing a we're sharing a block here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so, so I, I mean, I've seen a lot of crazy this last couple of weeks, but the thing that struck me most was the number of black parents like yourself who had to have the talk with their children about how to behave in public, in a public setting, where especially with the police. And that struck me more than anything in this past week. And I'm sorry for it. No, no, absolutely. Like, look, honestly, it's, it's okay to have these feelings. We're here to we're here to feel this way. We're here to there's people that we care about. If you're a human, you care about humans, right? And these are things that are going on. And the same way that you are you're showing your care is, is why we are all here in this forum to do that. So don't feel sorry if you're shedding a tear. If you feel anger, these are emotions. We should have that. We're humans. We should be allowed to do that. Um, I said I make sure I don't lose my space. <laughs> And I believe, uh, was it Livia you had a comment? Yes, I do. I'm just trying to take a deep breath before I get started. Um, I don't even know if I can do it. <laughs> um, take your time. So yes, having a conversation with your kid is very hard. Just a moment. <sighs> These past few days have been very difficult for me. And I have shared this with a few of you yesterday in a meeting that we had. Um, I'm having a really hard time um, processing. I don't know if I can do this. <laughs> I'm having a really hard time. Olivia, you can um, do it. I'll hold your hand. Processing all this hate that's out there. 
um, like Adiz, I've experienced a lot of the same things that Adiz has shared with us today. I came here 23 years ago as well. And, and I, 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 I don't think I've ever really experienced any racism, um, um, the, the true essence of at least racial discrimination um, until I came to this country. Um, and um, unfortunately, I love this country for everything that it's, all the opportunities that it's provided for me. Um, I'm an American citizen today and I'm very grateful. I mean, this is my home. Um, but unfortunately, I've had to deal with a lot of, um, you know, very sad and, and, and somewhat traumatic experiences. Um, you know, I've been, and I was getting my master's degree, I've been told that I would never get an A in a class because I'm not a native speaker of English. <laughs> Seriously, a professor told me that I would never get an A in his class because even though my paper was great, he would never give me a full A because I was not, uh, uh, and I wasn't the only one who was told that. Same thing. Um, you know, I have, uh, when I first arrived in the United States, um, I remember I, 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 I arrived in New, in New Jersey and I went to, uh, and I was so excited and I went to, to get a, I went to a McDonald's and I was going to have McDonald's for the first time. And I, um, I ordered McDonald's and this lady um, at, at, the, at the front desk kept ask, asking me, the cashier kept asking me uh, for here or to go, but she was saying it so fast. <laughs> that I couldn't understand what she was asking me. She was saying, for here to go, here to go, here to go. And I was like, what? And I kept asking her, what are you saying? I couldn't understand what she was saying. And, and then after, you know, repeating it, you know, I don't know, five or six times trying to ask her, like not understanding what she was saying, I finally asked her, um, I, I said to her, eu não estou entendendo o que você está falando. Você está você tá falando muito rápido. And then she went, what? And I said, exactly. Um, so, um, can you please just slow down so I can understand what you're saying? And then she uh, very sarcastically said, for here or to go. And then I said, for here, please. And so uh, things like that, um, you know, something that I guess it was one of the, I guess people laugh about it now, but um, when I was first um, introduced to my now in-laws, <laughs> My husband is white and uh, he's a wonderful man. Um, I was introduced to my in-laws. They're from a very small town um, in Pennsylvania. I remember getting there and um, his parents has, have always been very uh, gracious with me, um, have welcomed me into their lives like I'm their own daughter. But that very first time I was introduced to my, my today, my now in-laws, I. Um, um, it was one afternoon, I turned around and I'm like, where, where's Scott? Where's my husband? And then his mom says, oh, he went to, he went to his, um, to his grandmother's house. And I'm like, without me, why didn't he take me with him? You know, I'm like, this is my first time here. So he left me all alone. Um, and then I, I, I later questioned my husband and he said he had to go, um, talk to his grandparents. Uh, to tell them that he wasn't bringing a white girl home, um, that he needed to prepare his grandparents for the fact that, you know, I wasn't one of, of their own. And um, because he had, you know, had bad experiences in the past, you know, knowing his grandparents, he just didn't want me to be in an uncomfortable situation. Um, and again, um, we got over that, but, um, Experiences like that, and, and recently, um, what happened to George um, the other day, I, I happened to be watching the news, and my daughter walks in, and she sees what happens, what's happening, and I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't lie to her. I don't want to lie to her. And I, I unfortunately had to explain to her, you know, uh, what was going on. And uh, had... I had to have that difficult conversation with her. She's like, mom, but why? Why, why do they hate black people? She, her best friend is black, <laughs> you know? And then she goes, so they hate, they hate my friend, Honore, too? too? And um, 
So it's been very hard. And I want to say, Dr. Douglas, um, unfortunately, um, you have uh, people that work for Bristol Community College that do not share the same feelings that I'm sharing with all of you right now. Um, I've experienced racism inside of Bristol Community College. My, my, my students have experienced racism inside of Bristol Community College. And it's not easy for me to say this in front of all of you, and especially to you, Dr. Douglas, but I feel like um, you need to hear it. Um, and it, it, did, it, it came from, from staff. Um, I've, I, and I've heard things like, uh, you know, when, when uh, Trump took office, um, you just wait until Trump starts doing what he promised and that uh, he's gonna send you and all of your students home. Um, and, um, you know, obviously I think I'm educated enough and, and most of the time I am mentally, <laughs> uh, you know, stable. <laughs> <laughs> to to reply back and and say you know and and and, and educate, um, but I just wanted you to know that um, there there have been times where I was hosting um, the international club's uh, Thanksgiving dinner, and um, I remember Diane Manson was giving a speech right right after everything was happening with the Muslims and all the discrimination that was happening towards the Muslim students and. Um, and Diane was saying, you know, this is a safe place for you. Um, we're here for you. Bristol is, is a safe place. And, and, and you yourself, Dr. Douglas, you know, gave a speech and you said the same thing. And at a table right next to me, um, there was someone who said, well, if you're not here, if you're not happy here, just go home, just go back home. That was a faculty person. That was a faculty member at Bristol Community College. And so I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's great that we're all sharing our stories, um, but what now? What is going to happen now? You know, when we talk about accountability, um, when things like that happen, what, what, what do we do? What is the college going to do um, to, to, to get the message across to those people you know, and make them understand once and for all that there's no room, there's no room whatsoever at this place, at this college for, for racism or discrimination or, or anything of, of that nature. Um, so I, I am sorry for bringing this up because, you know, perhaps this wasn't the best place to do it, but I just felt like it, I, I, I needed to share this with all of you. Um, I've had great experiences too, and you know the 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 great the the, the good experiences are better than than the bad experiences. Um, but there have been quite a a number of bad experiences in which I and my students have experienced racism and discrimination at this institution, and uh, I just wanted to put it out there. Um, and I think that's it. And I am sorry for getting so emotional. I, like I said, this has been a, a rough few days with everything that's going on. And it's, it's hard to, to, to not allow yourself to some, you know, to, to let this contaminate you, you know, all this, this hate contaminate you sometimes, but I have a lot of love to give and I've been doing that. Um, I've been giving that love to my students and my, my colleagues, and I hope that um, I'm able to continue to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Livia, for sharing that. That's extremely in, in important, powerful message. And you're hearing a lot of powerful messages. Um, I, I want to just let, tra I'm not transitioning completely, but I want to let us know that it is at 530. But these are powerful things that people need these spaces. I'm not, we're not eliminating what's going on. We want everyone to be able to, if you have to leave at 530, you can you can do so. It is, will be recorded and captioned. Um, what we're looking to do, um, everyone will receive an, um, an email with next steps and things to do. I will probably just right now briefly go over next steps, just so that way I, I, at least we can get that. But you will be emailed it, and then we'll keep it back open, and we'll go right back to the comments, just so that way 
where everybody, if you want to stay here, I'm not going nowhere. Let's let's keep you know keep talking and 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 sharing your comments and things because this is the problem. Is sometimes is we 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 go by a clock and it's and we're not able to get out what we need to say. And there's a lot in here that we that needs to be said. So um, so Melissa, if you don't mind going to the the couple of quick tactics. Um, the purpose of me doing this, uh, I just want to make sure that those who have to leave and go just to kind of go over some of those things so they can hear it from me versus just reading it. Um, there's a couple of takeaways and steps of these. Um, we're going to be launching what's called a social justice campaign. I met with our employee resource group yesterday um, where they were helping me guide me to kind of really kind of be creative and figuring out things that we can do. Um, we need to make sure that we are developing this um, campaign that is something that you can be involved with. The, you, what's unique about COVID is we are starting to learn how to be a little bit more nimble and do things virtually. So if you're able to be part of this, we would love to see you. We have a capacity of, you know, right now over 100 plus people and we can, we can host more up to 300 people at least right now. Um, and we would love to see that, especially if you're from other institutions. I know a lot of other people here from different universities and colleges around the country. Um, around the, the Commonwealth, um, at least, and um, some that are outside of uh, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. If you want, um, I know right now we're trying to figure out how we can help each other. I, you know, contact me and I can help you um, do this and we can kind of figure it out. Again, I said it's not very academia, some of these next steps that you have. When we go into those social justice campaigns and we have a lot more time to prepare, you'll see a lot more research and resources and things that are, that are embedded that will be able to help you. Um, so again, I want you, we're going to be sending out a save the date, which will give you guys, which will give everybody in here. Um, we have a campaign that's going over the next 18 weeks. That campaign will then give you a bunch of different titles that we will be able to go over. Okay. So again, um, there, a lot of them are being developed right now. Um, this is part of our FY21 goal. Um, but we need, the reason why we need to do that, I mean, we've broken some great numbers with the center. We've had the MLK. Um, breakfast, which was, you know, hundreds of people in the community, a South Coast event that had hundreds of people in the community. There's things that people want that we understand and people want more of it. And this will be part of that. Okay. Um, celebratory things are great and we will continue that, but we need to kind of get into the nitty gritty of how we can mend, mend wounds and stuff. I don't want, we're talking about a lot of our experience and things that have happened because people have attacked us and we held them. Because if you look at um, our people that are brown skin and people of color, we're strong looking people and, and we hold it together very, very well. It's hard to hold it together well. Um, in, in, in air, even this is virtual, you're feeling it right now. This is a virtual meeting and I'm feeling every single comment. Every, I'm looking at all your screens, I'm flipping between the screens. It's important and this is our next level to the work. Um, our next session, the session that we will have will be race and social justice and that will be on July 2nd. Um, 2020 time will be determined. We will send out an invite for everybody on here. The key to this and why I'm looking at actionable items in the next step, if you are part of this and you signed up, you will receive an email from us on these things that are ongoing. You won't have to research and search for them. You will get a newsletter. You will get emails, resources, books to read, things that you can do to in order to help. I had so many, I had friends of mine, colleagues of mine who don't identify with my race or culture calling me tearing up, feeling small, I don't know what to do, I wanna help, how can I help you? Well, I can't have everybody working in the center, although I would love to, it doesn't work that way. Um, but what we wanna do is get you, guys in a, get you guys materials where you can influence and make a change in your, in your circle, whatever that is. If you're an administrator, figuring out ways that you can be more encompassing to your employees and students. If you are a person that is not an administrator, how you can influence change from your position, showing your talents and things, or, or really showing some of your um, feelings towards things and really contribute to meetings, uh, maybe finding uh, resources that are out there and forwarding to some of your um, to some of your constituents or um, or leaders. Um, next, again, I'm going to try to race through this. So again, I'll, I'll skip through some of it. Okay, so understanding you is very very important here. Um, so as you're understanding yourself, so I have this as Understanding, uh, um, understand that it is okay to feel uncomfortable when talking about and dealing with race matters. This is un uncomfortable for a lot of us. It's uncomfortable for the people that are sharing and crying and showing vulnerability. It's uncomfortable for the people that are listening that never ever experienced this stuff. It's real people and we gotta make sure that we have an understanding that it is real and it's okay that you don't know that you have the answers. I don't have the answers. I do this for a living. I work on race relations for a living. I don't have all the answers. This is why I'm asking you 
as a community to come together so we can figure it out, work together, um, and, and, really merge to get, and, and really merge to make this a greater Bristol County, Bristol Community College, and just a better um, a country as a whole. All right, when people are presented with ideas that counter your own, okay, there is a psychological stress reaction called cognitive dissonance, okay? Have, that's a key word, look it up, really research it if you, if you need. I will be able to send your materials in the future. This occurs when, um, when you begin to consider new ideas that conflict with your previous belief. It's okay that you, that you think all lives matter. That's okay if you've said it. I don't want you to feel guilt. That's okay, that was a thought process that you have. But understand that if I'm asking you for help because I'm a black man and I'm feeling a particular way, or if a black woman is asking you because they're feeling a way that is really bothersome from them, make sure you understand that we are looking at that person. That's why today I was intentional saying that this is, this is standing with black and African American men and women in this right now. This was not for people of color or everybody. I'm not doing that, right? This is very intentional because people are experiencing that. But as you can see, people from other races, other backgrounds, people that are international, they are all, we are all feeling this, feeling um, different types of uh, pressures and we're feeling, we're feeling the hurt that is just, it, sometimes it's a little bit too much for some of us to handle. And that's why a lot of us sometimes ignore and we don't, we don't take action because it's just easier for us to just kind of go about our business, okay? Um, so again, uh, next slide, please. Key takeaways from, from today, all right? We must learn to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, as I, as I said, so we allow ourselves the space to learn and grow, okay? That's important. Right now, if you felt a pain in your stomach today, that means, <laughs> that means there's something there. You're a human, we get it, right? Uh, I, haven't, you know, I haven't cried since he was born, and trust me, you guys got me very, very close to it, right? And that's, those are the things that I feel that 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 we need to we understand that something needs to happen how do we influence that how can i learn you need to learn for yourself you need to teach yourself first before you can do things read some books read some of the materials that we will have for you be supportive of each other and understand that challenging ideas can and will be difficult this is how we um, you contribute to influencing change we want to influence change so we got to understand that in order to do that you have to have to challenge ideas because it's just gonna help, help everyone as a whole. Next one. All right, so not every person, of, understand this, a couple of things, I just got key points here. Um, not, understand that not every person of color um, has had the same experiences when it comes to racism, discrimination, et cetera. One person may have severely been affected, others may not have, okay? Make sure you're not making assumptions about individuals, listen, remain objective, until you know exactly how that person needs you to react, help, or just maybe be available, okay? Listen, all right? Make sure you, that you have that, okay? Be aware of your implicit biases. Also be aware of er that everyone else has them too, okay? So I'm a, a black male, I'm not perfect. I have biases as well. Some of our biases towards police officers may be incorrect. This is why social justice for formats that we're trying to look will help um, really break down these barriers. And, and, and I already had our police, I had several of our campus police officers, several uh, um, people in our community contact me privately through email or in my DMs asking me how can they help, how can we come together, and that's what we're going to do. And, and, but it's important that we get people there, we get the youth there. I had youth um, programs call me as well because they want to get involved. They want actionable changes, they want to hold people accountable, but they want to make sure they do it in the right way. They understand that, that the protesting and the, the, the gatherings are going to have to end soon. Um, so they want to make sure that we, we, are, we have things in motion, okay? Um, so again, the definition is there. I just wanted to tell you about that. Next slide, please. Key takeaways there. Understand that these biases affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in, sub, in a subconscious ma manner. We may not even realize it, okay? And that's okay. This is what these programs are for. This is what um, formats like this is for. So we can start understanding and feel our, um, and really start to really understand who we are subconsciously, right? Believe it or not, people think that it's always a black and white issue. Uh, no, it's not a black and white issue. There are black police officers that are racist against black people, right? So again, now that's deep. Understand that, look it up, see it. You'll see it in movies. 
You see it in, in videos and all the things that are out there because people truly don't really understand it. It's not black versus white. It's black versus racism. It's two different things. You, but the problem is that sometimes it is portrayed in the media that, we're, that it's really um, about black versus white. And then this is where some people are really upset about, and I get it, all right? So for people that are white, you feel attacked. I get it. I get it because you're like, I'm not racist. I get it. Do not worry. This is what these things are for, to really start really chipping away at these barriers. Be aware of your own emotional responses and how it affects your ability to communicate with others. Trust me, if I yell at you, you're going to do two things. You're going to get really quiet. You're going to yell right back, right? The, nothing is accomplished that way. So understand, and this is, goes out for our people in higher authority, how you use your power, how uh, people that, are author, um, that pull over people, how you use your power. There needs to be change there and how our approaches are. And I will, hopefully we can work in, in creating that. Because if you're asking, I've been pulled over and asked many a times, and that triggers me. I, it has happened to me twice. I have three cars registered in my name, where I get the money, why, where am I going? And I was pulled over for having a dim light, uh, license plate light. And they're asking me where I get the money. Like, wait a second, I can't own three cars. I think I'm pretty successful. I can, I can do that. You know, I ain't rich and balling, but I have three cars. Like, whoop de do, right? All right, next one. Please don't, these are things that don't do, all right? Use people of color to justify your point versus other people of color. Okay, it is highly offensive. You see things that are out there. You see a person like a Candace Owens or, or someone who you see a video and their perspective is completely different than the majority of people of color. That, I, I don't, I'm that person. Again, I've told you, I'm standing in the middle. I listen to both sides, both materials. I read it, I watch it to nauseam. However, as that's happening, understand that, think to yourself, why are people of color not agreeing with this woman? Yeah, her views might, might agree with me, but remember what I told you, there are people who discriminate against their own people. Don't mean you have to be a racist, there could be a bias that she has, there might be a belief that she has, or someone like that has, that can really affect people, and then, but if you use that as your justification and put it on my wall, uh, or share, or send me an email and look, look this person, now, there's ways of doing it. Don't put it out to the public, say, hey, I saw this with Candace, this is what she said, or I saw this with this other person, and this is what they said, what are your points of it? And if you're friends with somebody, I'm pretty sure they can, they, we can kind of go back and forth as professionals. All right, apologize, right? Do not, again, please do not apologize for your whiteness, guys. Like, like don't do that, right? We, we should not have to apologize for our differences. It reflects our guilt and to those who are supposed to be supporting, all right? So again, if you, you know, just say, you know, I'm you, who you are as a man, you come to that person, don't apologize for it. Um, I think a little bit too much of that is going on and we need to really recognize some of, um, some of that, right? And don't dominate the conversation. Listen to your counterparts. Next slide, please. Please do influence change where you can, all right? You don't have to be MLK of the world. Stop thinking so grand. Be the MLK of your, of your circles, your little circles, right? Be that person, be that change agent in those circles. That creates it. So if it's your department, if it's your, if it's your division, if it's just you by yourself, if it's your family, make sure you are doing that, okay? Stop saying no to, uh, uh, stop saying no all the time. True supporters will help resources for a greater good of the people they claim they care about. That goes to everyone. That means if you're a president of the United States, a president of a college, uh, a, a, a dean of a department, if you're a, a police chief, if you're a mayor, if all of a sudden you say, I stand with you, but every time we ask, I need more resources, I need this in order to impact our students or our population or our community and they keep but you give them a nice no it's no different than the other no that they get okay so be a change agent where you can influence allow those things to happen put maybe sometimes change your change your style of how you look at things put somebody in power that might be untraditional that can maybe help and put a different set of eyes at the table that can look and and see things differently than maybe it has been for tradi for a long period of time okay and that goes with saying, you know, communicate. Ask someone how, how they are doing. There's a ton of people of color who are struggling, okay, uh, that you are colleagues and, and claim friends with. How many, how many times you, you call? I have several, a lot of you that are in here that are white who did call me and ask me how I was doing, sent me an email, said they were thinking about, I appreciate it, thank you. It, it, it really means a lot because I've always been seen as the mentor, so who, and the person who has to go out there and do these things but you don't get it as much. It's great for, it feels good 
when someone can just say, hey, how are you doing? You don't even have to get into it. Thinking about you, how are you doing? Shoot an email, you know, send a card, you know, a text. That's it, right? Uh, next slide. Again, these are classroom strategies. I won't get into all of them, but if you're a professor, this will be included of different things that are, that are pedagogical strategies and things that you can do to really connect with students. I know that's something that is that resonates big time. We go to a lot of these diversity trainings, but what are, can we do? I know with some of our assessment trainings that we did this year for the Multicultural Center, we were looking at tactics, uh, a multicultural center, um, along with um, Katie Ruggieri, uh, Engen Atase, Brian McGuire, and, um, and Julie Jodwin, these are great allies for me that I utilized. We, we created an assessment and we, we started working together on how we can get the message out to make sure we're equitable for all our students. And we came away, and, and the professors that were in this workshop got items that they could utilize for their classroom. This is what we're trying to do in building the social justice um, platform so that we were able to get um, information to our professors to better serve our students. I know you want to. I don't want people to feel guilt, like I was saying. I know you want to help. So let's make sure that um, our leaders are putting things in place to help you get the materials to help our students of color or from different backgrounds. Next slide, please. And a couple of things that we'll be doing over the time, we'll be sending several um, books and reads for you guys to look and purchase, okay? We're also, um, today when you get the email, the email will also will have a, the email will have um, links to like black owned, um, uh, bookstores that are here in Massachusetts um, and also around the, around the country. But we want to kind of start doing like a book club, different things that are out there so you can kind of learn. There's some basic books that we have, but there's like a starter kit. Um, a, a good friend of mine shared this with me, uh, some of the stuff and how to kind of go in order. Um, I had a bunch of titles and then I was just going to send a bunch of titles. Um, but thank God that, you know, actually was um, Paige Jones sent me and kind of showed me the different sections of how to, you know, like, to get this out. And so what we want to do is start off with a couple of books. You can look these up. Um, they're right. They'll be, they'll be there. You, you can read them. Let me know how you feel. I know some people need that. So um, we want to make sure we provide you with those resources. Next slide, please. And that's it. Right. Yeah, that's, that's all. <laughs> Yeah. So again, I want to just thank everyone again. So we're not going to get off, but if you have, um, if you want to stay, you want to talk and we want to impact, this is open to you, right? This is our community. We want to take over it. We want to make sure that we're, there's nothing but positive change. Um, there's going to be professionals that are going to stay in here, people that I call that are, that, are, that are actionable allies. These are allies that really want to make a change. If you have a question about your, your college, because you're not from Bristol Community College, but you're here from a different college, that let's do that let's have that conversation if you're from a, a community partner i got a lot of uh, community partners that i've worked with in the past that are in here if you have a question about that let's do that maybe we will go back and forth with some of the um we'll go back and forth with some of the uh the questions and 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 things that we have in there um we'll be able to do that whatever it is that's on your mind if it's a statement if you you, you want to laugh if you want to cry we're here we're not going anywhere um, but if you do want to leave and, and go, you know, and, and take on your day, I know you have children and food and everything else going on. Just understand that we're not, we're going to do our part to make sure that you, all right, are fully aware of the things that you can do to help influence your areas. That will be my job. Your job will be able to take this information, look it over and, and start applying it. If you need to apply it after this, contact me. Contact others that are in here. If it's a one-on-one, -on -one, how you can influence your area, it could be private, no one needs to know. Then maybe I can sit there and use tactics that I use with, my, with some of my students. People always ask me, what's the difference? You know, our retention rate over some of my students or my basketball athletes or how they graduate at a higher rate, what do you do? There's no formula, right? It's just making sure that you, you have a good heart, you're open and you care. That's, and a lot of you have that, but sometimes we're a little afraid to intervene because we may not identify the same. So again, if you want to leave um, and, and have a great night, I appreciate you, I love you all. Thank you for allowing this voice to be heard. Um, we will record the last until, you know, however long it, it is, we'll probably go another half hour or so, and then we can kind of get this, uh, this, this thing rolling here at Bristol, Bristol County, um, our area, 
um, are, you know, we're just, we'll, we're, we're going to touch hearts. Trust me when I say that. I don't know how many we're going to influence, but we're going to touch hearts. We're going to be involved. We're going to make sure that we are a true community college and that we're serving our community as a whole. There's a lot of people hurting, and I'm not going to sit around and allow that to continue to happen. So thank you. And if you want to stay on, so be it. And let's, let's make this happen. Um, all right. So we're staying on, so let's do it. And I got 100 million. Let's see, where am I? And I believe the next person who wanted to share something was Jay Yoon. Is Jay, you still here? He might have left. So some people might have left if I go through them. Let me know if you're here, Jay. I, will. I think Jay left a comment. Um, sorry, oh, I'm to hide. All right. Yeah, he left a comment. Right. You mind reading it? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not 100% certain exactly okay. where it is. It's. It was. It was a while ago. So. No, see. absolutely. Yeah, I'm. I'm looking at it as well. I know Jay was next <laughs> on my paper here. Oh, I got it from him. So one comment I will, so Jay said one comment I would like to share is while traveling in Europe and Asia, I noticed one big difference, police interaction with people. There is no other country in the world where police go um, on high speed chases with guns raised and police with military equipment. And um, if we want real change, think, um, I think this has to start with um, how we um, police are trained. So that was just a comment by him. Um, and then the next one, uh, let's see here. Deborah, you said that you had a face, um, a Facebook. Is Deborah still here? You had a, you, you share something on Facebook and you like to share with everyone if possible. I'm not sure if you're here still, Deborah. Okay. And then, uh, so Deborah doesn't look like she's here. So Corinne said, no matter, um, no matter what someone's uh, past may be, no one deserves to die with a, a knee on their neck um, and keep speaking the truth which I think that is kind of in, in relation to this uh, Facebook post that I shared um, and then how that was reacted. Um, we did get to, Megan, do you have a question or comment? Yeah, I have a comment and a couple questions. So my comment is based off like stuff I would see on like social media and posts and stuff I hear. Um, a lot of things I hear, um, it, two things I've been hearing a lot that bothers me is, um, oh, all lives matter and also the, I went through, I struggled, so I don't have white privilege. So I want to touch on the white privilege thing first. Um, now, growing up, obviously, I don't feel like maybe you don't realize in the moment, but obviously, like, reflecting, especially now, I think a lot of people can see it. Growing up, uh, for me, I grew up single mother. I grew up very poor on the system. Um, both, my, both my parents were addicted, but um, even then, like, even... I was the only white kid sometimes in my um, classroom, but even then, I still see, like, how I had white privilege. When I went to the class, um, my teachers looked like me. I was learning about people that looked like me. Um, my mom never had a conversation with me about, you know, if you get pulled over if when I was driving. Um, I never had a, whenever, whenever, if I ever get pulled over, I don't have to worry about, um, my biggest fear is getting a ticket. I don't have to worry about someone trying to kill me, a cop trying to kill me. And that's, that right there is white privilege. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to, um, you don't have to not go through struggle to be white privilege. White privilege is just, you get some benefits or you don't have to live in fear just because of the color of your skin. Or you don't, I have to like, I, I learn about racism. I don't have to experience it. That's white privilege. Um, and all lives matter. First off, black lives matter is not saying all lives don't matter. Um, an analogy that I liked that I saw was saying like, say if everyone's at a table and everybody gets a plate, but Rob. And Rob says, hey, where's my plate? And one other person says, well, Rob, everyone deserves a plate. What are you talking about? Rob's not saying everyone doesn't deserve a plate. He's just pointing out the fact that he doesn't have a plate either. Like he doesn't have a plate. So that's what Black Lives Matter means. Now the question I have is, I have two questions. One. I'm in, um, on Facebook, I'm in a little couple groups with about forever, like grew up in forever and stuff like that. And I keep seeing these posts and look like stuff like this. And I feel like it keeps being said, it keeps being said, explain, like explain these people, but it's not going through their heads. How do you deal with people that's like that way? I feel like you, like we said, we have to speak up against racism and stuff like that. But how do you deal with ignorance where like you keep trying to educate people, educate people, but they don't, they don't see it. 
um, do you just ignore them? Do you just give up hope or do you keep trying to work with it? I'm just like, that's where I'm kind of losing hope. So I'm like, how can, how much I can I change someone's mind? How much can I change when people are not changing? And another thing, I'm sorry, guys. Well, do you want to say something? No, go ahead. Oh, oh. And another thing um, is that one thing that scares me is right now is that we I feel like we've been here before. One of, a lot of people were saying like, oh, um, complain about the riots and looters. And one of the reasons why I haven't said anything because I feel like everything has been tried and it hasn't worked. So what do you really expect people to do? There's really nothing to do with some people. Now, obviously, there might be some people who are just trying to follow the crowd and get some likes and stuff, but there are people that are actually hurting and they feel like they need to be heard and there's, they can't, they're not being heard and it's anger. So, like, I don't really know what to tell. Like, what are you supposed to, how are you going to tell someone to protest if you never felt that pain? You know, like, how are you, you going to tell someone how to deal with pain if you never felt it? Um, and, like, honestly, like we said, like I said, everything's been tried and I'm kind of in a spot, like you were saying earlier, like, what can we do? Like, what? Like I know protests are still happening. It's great to see everyone come together, but I feel, I'm I'm scared that you know a couple months from now this thing's gonna happen again. Um, so I'm trying to look at like maybe the next phase. Like what can we do if it's policy, if it's education, if it's so many things. I just want I don't want to be in the same spot in a couple months or a couple weeks or. So, thank you so much. Megan is one of our student leaders that I've worked with in in the past. So, um, and I thank you for eloquently putting that and showing your perspective and it. You are that change, and like you said, you are a person who identified different from, from me, but you, your perspectives are there, and that means you, you are a person that sees it. You're not going to change everyone. It's just not gonna happen. And it's, I, I'm gonna let people, you'll be exhausted if you try to fight every Facebook post. I, I'm ignoring, like this post that this man wrote today, I'm ignoring it because the change is for the people that, again, my son, the students in here that uh, that are coming to the center, people that I can really help influence, that bringing that heart to the surface and really impacting change is going to is, is what you what we all need to do. If we want to try to change the mindset of someone who just does not want to, then we have to move on from that person and continue doing the good work because it will make you exhausted. The things that you are seeing that are out there, the all lives matter. Um, the, the different perspectives, how George Floyd's life was, these are all distractions to take you away from where your heart really is. And you need to continue to influence and understand that you care about people, then do something that you can help to care, to help those people who need you. And don't worry about the people who want to be a, another way because it's greater good for the greater number. If, if I do something and I know it's going to influence, you know, hundreds of people over here, three people, I'm not going to change their mind then they can, you know, they can just do what they need to do on their side and that's fine and it's, it's totally okay. Um, the other thing with, with, with the privilege, having that understanding and knowing the difference of our privileges is, is impactful because we all have privileges and when we, I think sometimes as people that are not, uh, white people I think have to understand what white privilege is. I'm not a huge component of always throwing that down someone's throat. But what I am is saying that we all have privileges. So that I try to teach it from that perspective. If you do have somebody that's really asking about it, as a male, I have privilege over uh, women because there's certain things that are catered towards me. As a black male, I might have privileges over someone who is um, Latinx, right? Or so, you know, that may be in a situation. Or as a coach, I have privilege. Or in my position in my job, I may have privilege. But there are a lot of disadvantages that I have because I'm not. Um, because I'm not white, you know, I'm not, you know, those are things that are also there. So I try to tell people to understand where their own privilege is and where they come from and things that may be different. And even to my students, you know, uh, students of the center that are here, you guys can, if you ever want to chime and speak up, I talk about these things because these are important conversations to have because I think people are very defensive. And every time we, we step in a room and we say, you got white privilege, they don't know how to react. They, all of a sudden they're like, what are you talking about? I grew up just like Megan. I was the only white kid in my class. I grew up poor. I, I work for everything I got and not understanding that, yeah, you work for everything you got, but it's different. The, you know, people tell me that I can't be certain things because I don't have my PhD yet, or, but then I see people that don't look like me and they got their master's degree and they're in higher positions. Why is that, right? Although I'm going for it, but why, is, why do I see a group of, you know, and those are things that you kind of, that kind of resonate and you say, well, that's privilege because no one will take me as serious because maybe I don't have all that education, but no one saw all the things I did because 
I was an a I was unable to afford it. So I just educated myself on other things or my, you know, that I had to do. There's discriminatory things that are put in place that just happen. And you, sometimes we just got to try to create change, like I said, in our circles and, and develop that. I don't know if anybody else wanted to add in. You guys, as I'm, it's not just questions and answers for me. If anybody want to chime in, you can jump in as well. Rob, this is Deborah. I couldn't get the mic no. to go on. Yeah. And I do have to leave. And I, I did want to share with you what I put on Facebook. I have to admit what you've been talking about today, I finally understand what white privilege means. I've always gotten my hackles up because of that particular phrase. But now I, I, I can walk into a store and smell the clerk and say good morning and I'm gonna get a totally different response from that clerk than someone else might get. Um, and that's kind of horrifying. I really didn't think that that was going on still at this day and age in my country, in our country. But if you don't mind, I would like to read to you. I mean, I can either put it up on the screen or I can just read it to you. Which would you rather I do? You can read it to us. That's, that's perfectly fine. We'd love to hear your voice. Okay. Before I even read it, well, what I want to say is racism is nothing more than bullying. And if we're so freaking against bullying in our classrooms, why aren't we just as against racism. I don't get this. Oh, my clock's gonna go. Sorry. Okay. Racism. We all need to raise our children without their hearing words of hate for, fear of, condescension towards, condescension towards, excuse me, or angry envy for any other skin tone. We on this earth have an entire rainbow of skin tone, hair color, hair type, eye color. There is no such thing as race other than the human race. Racism is learned at the kitchen table of our parents, at the knees of our grandparents, in the homes of our children's friends, and from what children see and experience in school, on the sidewalks, and on the playgrounds of their hometowns. Also learned in these same places are empathy, tolerance, and the ability to discuss our differences of opinion, along with agreeing that we can simply disagree on some things. These are the behaviors our children should be learning from us. Flip over our hands and feet, and our skin color is the same. This is the way in nature. Each species, no, each genus, has a vast range of coloration, pattern, size, and not so often, but even gender. However, we're all of one kind. Birds, fish, insects, reptiles, felines, canines, and humans. We're all one genus with many colorations, patterns, and sizes. We are all one, one kind together. We all carry the same basic hard wiring in our brains, all carry the same basic potential to be whom and what we wish to be. I've seen a beautiful gift circulating on Facebook asking us all to flood the internet with a prayer for God to heal us. I believe in God. However, even more, I believe that it is not up to God to fix what has been broken. What is broken by man is to be mended by mankind. We may not all be responsible for the problem. However, we are all responsible for the mending. The silent majority of all skin tones must stand up and face down those we see performing or participating in acts of bigotry, both large and small. Calmly, quietly, we must band together to show that we not only stand as witness to the act, but that we disapprove of and will not accept the viewpoints, words, or actions of the bigotry being displayed before us. 
let the perpetrators of bigotry and senseless destruction to public and personal property know that as a group, we will not just stand witness, but testify to the abuse, not let someone else take care of it. It's time we gave God a reason to smile down on the children of earth. This is my prayer. This is my vow. That's powerful. Um, again, you know, what you said early in the beginning is you said that you, you, you battled with what understanding what privilege is, just having that sense of understanding and, and moving that, but we can continue doing that one person at a time. We, we'll, we can, our humanity can, we can get to where we're looking to get to. And I appreciate you for sharing um, it's very, very important words, just powerful words. Um, I, again, I have a ton of people that are on here, so I'm trying to navigate as best as I can. So if you do, if you are still here and you want to jump in, you can just maybe just say from that, you know, I think, uh, I know Serge had a question, uh, wanted to add something. Um, I also, Deb, you just did, and I'm looking at... There's a couple of others here that um, Carlos, I believe, if Carlos is still here. So I'm just trying to get people to make sure their voices are heard before um, we go from there. So I don't know if you want to start, Serge. Sure. Um, so my question was, well, not my question, my comment was if you could speak on the importance of um, our young minority students pursuing or at least considering pursuing a career in in education because I think it benefits all students when our our staff is very diverse so could you speak on um, the importance of that and how um, students of all color are impacted when they have teachers of color in, in their in their educational journey this is uh, I know you you asked me but does anybody want to jump in and I can I can I can start it and then somebody jumped in after Right. So I think, you know, just from the standpoint, it, this is a battle that we've always had. Um, people, uh, it hasn't been in, in, in an industry that people of color traditionally have really focused on. Um, and there's many, many reasons, and I won't get into all of them right now. Um, it is important. We have several things that we, initiatives that we've tried, a grant that I've uh, looked to apply for to really try to impact and get into the schools, um, working with you, Greater New Bedford both with yourself and also um, Wally De Silva, who is in here, looking to um, influence men of color to pursue education as, um, as part of their, their, their educational journey to maybe become a professor or a teacher and show that how they can impact and influence change that way as well. Um, it's highly, highly important. Um, there's many reasons why it's important um, because it's, it, you know, again, I think the reason why I might have success with some of the students I have is because I, I resemble them um, and that I work with, you know, and, it, but it doesn't not necessarily just have to be that. It's just a different perspective. I think the problem is, is a lot of these tables, sometimes we don't realize that our perspective may have a bias to it and we don't even recognize it. So it's good to have an individual who thinks a little bit differently. Um, and I think it's high, it's very very important um, for that to happen, and and you know we'll keep continue pushing it. I push it all the time to give them an out. Um, there's they're more than just you know the education is a is a career that you know that is highly important. Um, but sometimes it's tough if you're coming from schools that don't highlight their you know they don't highlight these educators or you're going to school where you don't see it, they just don't know if it's for them, you know? And so that, we have to try to change that narrative a little bit and really try to, you know, influence them to see that education is positive um, and that you can make a change if you get yourself um, to that level. So um, anybody else has anything else they want to add to it or? Yes, I'll add something faculty. Um, education for us has to start I think at a younger age. Um, but if you look at our school systems, where the students would come from, the inner city schools, the urban schools, they don't have the equipment. They don't have the books, they're sharing books. They don't have access to um, internet. So to prepare them to go into education, we have to equip those teachers 
in the younger schools, middle schools, high schools with the resources that they need so they can influence the students to become educators. And because right now, currently, all they see is their way out of that neighborhood is to look at the ball players. You know, I want to be a basketball player so I can buy my mother a house. Or I want to be a lawyer. Or I want to be a doctor. Because those are, that's what they see on TV as being affluent. We have to start from the roots up. And I think if we, some of the things that we have to do is encourage our students to pick the right professions. Uh, I'm not saying that photography is not a good profession, but I think we need people more in other professions like being teachers and educators. So we have to do our part in educating our students and we have to start from the root, start from when they're young to give them a, a, other opportunities, a more visual presence. How many movies do you see about fat students or teachers? There's very few movies about teachers, a lot about ball players, a lot about thugs, <laughs> but very few about educators. Yeah. So we have to start while they're young yeah. and change the dynamics of their environment. So policy, urban schools, find a way to volunteer, mm -hmm. you know, books for the students so that they're not sharing books, mm -hmm. internet. And we, I know we can't do it all at one time. It's a slow go, but we have to give back to the community so they can rise up. That's all I'm saying. Could could I jump in here? Hi, Doris. It's Hi. Kathleen. How are you How doing? Are you doing I'm doing good. Yeah, I just I want to talk about um, opportunities that I hope will open up at uh, Bristol. Um, right now, we have an uh, early childhood education program and then a very um, tiny elementary education program that doesn't extend through high school. Um, and I'm a couple of concerns. One is that the people who are in early childhood education who are now going to, they are uh, incumbent workers in child care centers they come from poor communities and they are going to be forced to get licensed and they're not going to get any uh, rewards for that monetarily. So that's one of my concerns. And the other one really is to expand the um, education major at Bristol so that we have an opportunity for especially males who want to teach, to teach in junior high school and high school, maybe coach as well. We don't have that right now. And um, I'm more, uh, my intention when I came here was to, to um, change the, the face of what we op offer to our community in terms of being able to become a teacher. So I'm hoping this coming year we can work on that um, again um, successfully. Um, Kathleen, thanks for sharing that. If, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll forward you a, a grant that myself and Engen Atase worked on last year that, mm -hmm. again, it was maybe it was a little bit too aggressive for the state to approve because obviously the state has guidelines that they need to get done within a year. Mm -hmm. But this might be very impactful for the community um, that yeah, I, we can forward your way. And then there might be some tactics in there, things that may be able, as far as recruitment, of these um, of students, you know, male students of color into into these type of programs, and yeah. um, so I'll forward that over to you. And you know, again, it's you know whatever you can take from it, may it might be helpful um, mm -hmm. doing that. So great, um, thank you, thank you, thank you yeah. so much, Rob. Yeah, no problem. Rob, can I um, can I chime in real quick? Yep. Um, so my name is Laura Gostin. I'm an instructor um, in Division One, and um, I just wanted to share my perspective from um, from a different angle. Um, I, um, my focus is uh, intercultural communication and um, as a, an immigrant myself and a non-native speaker of English, I can so much relate to what Livia was saying. I'm hoping to get through this without getting too emotional, 
because I have been this entire time. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to say I'm sorry to everyone who has experienced any form of racism, anybody that shared and who has shared. Um, for someone who is very interested in race relations is absolutely devastating to me. Um, I wanted to share from another perspective. As an educator, I want, I bring um, this discussion into the classroom all the time. I talk with my students about racism and I talk to them about white privilege. And many times um, I have been ridiculed and uh, discouraged and reacted very adversely from students sometimes, most of the time white male students. I still remember the one time when I was told in the classroom in the middle of everyone when I was talking about white privilege that racism does not exist that um my their white friends don't talk about it their black friends don't talk about it therefore it doesn't exist it's only those select few who continue to talk about it are a problem i don't even know how i kept it together until i got back to my office as a as a teacher i have to hold it together in front of my students in grad school my research was focused on race relations and intercultural situations and i'm sure you and i have spoken before about i don't know if you remember about my experience but i was always very discouraged from pursuing my thesis and my research um off the record so many doors were being closed in my in my face and i was uh, encouraged to basically change my research topic and told that why would someone why would i be interested in something like this all of us should be interested in something like this because it affects all of us and yes i do agree that we need to have black race uh, models role models but i think it's important for white professors to also speak up and talk about racism and it's important for all of us not just for a certain group of people to talk about it. All of this affects all of us, not just some of us. And it's a very important conversation that we need to have. And unfortunately, sometimes it has to come to violence for a message to be heard. I don't condone it, I don't agree with it, but sometimes it's, people get frustrated, I understand. I'm frustrated as well because I feel the entire time that I've been trying to work on this, I've got nothing but roadblocks, my research has been discouraged, uh, not addressed, because I basically found things that went against what the institution was trying to promote. And I'm not going to discuss about what institution it was. But the problem is, is in theory, we have all these ideals and all these things that we want to do. But in practice, they don't get put through. And that's the problem. When someone tries to do something and work towards it, uh, it is being ignored, is being, we're being silenced, we're being discouraged. And it's frustrating. I'm dealing with the same thing where I'm trying to educate, you know, the white community about white privilege. And I look at it differently. I'm an immigrant, you know, and I've been, just like Livia said, I've experienced those things many times, you know. And discrimination is, unfortunately, happens everywhere. We all need to get together and work together to end this. We can't just say this is your problem or this is your problem. It's all of our problem. And if we don't all do something, you know, it's never going to end. This needs to, I hear things about, you know, the police community needs to change. That needs to change. The change has to go much deeper than that. Change has to happen at the societal level. As a society, we encourage and we promote certain things, whether it's overtly or covertly. And that needs to change. And I think, thank you so much for having this discussion, this conversation, because I believe that is extremely important to talk about these things. The reason, like I tell my students, the reason why we are in the mess that we are is because we haven't been talking about things that matter. My, I'm a communication instructor. We need to talk about things that matter and not worry so much about, oh my God, someone's going to be sensitive. We can't talk about this because of that. No, we need to talk. We need to talk about things that are uncomfortable. That is the sign 
of an adult being able to discuss things that make you uncomfortable and hear truths that you may not want to agree with. It's not always easy for me to sit there and hear it, but it's true. White people have caused the most damage throughout history on this planet. Is it easy for me to hear that? No, but it is the truth. I am also German. You know, that also comes with a certain amount of, of heaviness. I carry that guilt with me. And sometimes people react a certain way. Can I change the past? No. Can I influence the future? I hope so. You know, and I think, it, like I tell my students all the time, being uncomfortable is a sign of growth. We all need that. If you're comfortable all the time, you are not growing. We need this discussion. We need to do something about it. I want to offer myself as a resource to you and to anyone. I want to, us to band together and be able to do something. So again, I am so, I was mortified. I, I was crying most of the time and trying not to look at some of the images that are being posted because it's hard from a human perspective to look at that and to even think that someone would be treated like that based on the color of their skin, their sexual orientation, their whoever they worship or whatever they worship or any difference. We are all the same. We are human and we let them just, you know, separate us by race, by political orientation, by gender, by who cares? We need to band together and find the things that we have in common. I'm sorry for the rant, but it's been stymieing for a while. Thank yeah, you so it, much for listening. It needs, to be, it needs to be heard. And, you know, thank you for sharing that. And again, you come from great perspectives. And people need to hear this because this is how you influence change. And if we, I know, again, look, I mean, people had to go, but there's a lot of people on here still because it's powerful. People need this. It's, it's something that's needed. So, you know, that's why we're here. And we want to make sure that we are a caring community. And the only way we're going to be a caring community is we have to hear each other. Only way. It's not, we can't just say, I care for you. And, oh, by the way, don't say anything. Exactly. We need, Thank you. need perspective. Um, so I have um, uh, Carlos, yes. Travis, then Wadley. Right. Yep. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm Carlos Avila. I work over in the dual enrollment department, College Access. Um, I think, like everybody, th this is um, this is almost like the, the the scab constantly getting like peeled off when, you, when, you, when you're trying to heal. It's another issue. It's it's it goes on now. It's almost weekly. You know, it, it's back in the news almost on a weekly basis. Um, the the unfortunate thing is a lot of these men and women that have been um, killed regardless of race, um, never had the chance to grow. You know, like I, when I was young and I didn't, and I had issues with the police, my, my tactic was fight fire with fire. You know, like you're coming at me, I'm going to come at you. And that never went well for anybody. Um, thankfully I was given the opportunity to, you know, wise up and grow and be a contributing member to my community and see that the, the real issue here is education. Um, Sometimes, in, and most times in law enforcement, they just do not receive uh, proper education. Like they're, they're good on policy, they, you know, they, they're very you know, strict on their, their, their rules. Um, but when you're trained to be a hammer, all, all you see are nails. You know, everybody to you is a nail, and you're trained to just hammer them down, unfortunately. Um, and that, that is the reason why we have as many issues that we do. Um, discretion isn't applied um, equally. Um, when, when people use white privilege, uh, that, that, that's a real thing. Um, I've experienced that. When you look at Carlos Avila, you don't think you're going to see my face. So I've been pulled over several times. And the most recent time, the officer came up to the car before he saw me. and was saying, que pasa, Carlos? Right? Thinking he's going to see like a traditional tan skin, black haired, Puerto Rican guy. And then he sees me and goes, oh, are you Carlos? And I said, yeah, I'm the owner of the vehicle. And immediately when he saw me, he became disarmed. I'm like, wow, that, that, that really, was a, really was a pass, you know, at, at that point in time that a lot of people don't get. I, I, I was able to at least, once I saw him become a little bit less cocky, I, I, I advised him, hey, you do understand that typically what you did there was uh, a tactic that would be used to trigger somebody to get a reaction, to get you to escalate your actions and make this a big deal when it should have just been a you were going five miles over the speed limit, you know, it could have been that conversation. Thankfully for me, that's all it was. But had I been younger, Carlos, I would have made a deal about it. And who knows what would happen? You know, well, maybe I wouldn't, I wouldn't be at Bristol because that doesn't look good when you show up with, with a record, you know, for, you know, agitating with the police. Um, so again, that, that is the, the, the big takeaway is 
there is not enough soft skill training, if, if we're calling it that. There is not enough of the community policing involvement. Um, because even now in the protest, you see more of the protesters openly engaging with police and showing them love. Then you do see the police officers showing the community that they're there to protect. You know, they're, they're not, it's not being reciprocated evenly. And, and unfortunately, that's always been the case with, uh, with the black community, communities of color. Uh, they are always the most forgiving uh, to the people who are oppressing them. And that's been going on for centuries. Um, and that, that, that unfortunately still goes on today and we're seeing it uh, with, with the protests, you know. I know that Baxter was here earlier today. I wish I'd be able to connect with him. But I talked with my close friends and I let them know, you know, unfortunately, you're, you're paying for the actions of the few. But you need to understand that now that you're one of the, the good guys, you need to be speaking up against those few bad guys that are giving everyone a bad name. Some officers are taking that, that, that advice. Um, I don't know, you know, at some point in time, they do start to get hardened themselves because some, some people may have taken that job, you know, if what would what their mind were good, uh, good motivations and, and, and a time like this may even radicalize them, unfortunately. So th th this is a time where people from all backgrounds need to come together, especially those in education. We need to teach these skills and teach people how to communicate with one another to not get to these points, you know, with none of this stuff needed to happen. You know, yeah. that, that's all I have right now. That's that's so powerful, and, and um, Carlos, thank you for sharing. The the one thing that I saw, I forgot who said it, um, but it, they were stating, uh, you know, that whole one bad cop. There's plenty of good cops. There's only, you know, that one bad cop shouldn't speak for it. And I and I get that theory. But a person said, like, if you were on a team, and this is why I kind of this comment resonated with me as I coach. If you were on a team and you know one of your players was molesting children, and you don't say something, are you all good people? Right. And I think that's, to me, that was kind of like, wow, like I didn't think of it from that type of perspective, but you're part of that. If you're witnessing it and you're not saying the change that's hurting people, same thing as a teacher, you know, we have our students that we're supposed to protect. We're mandated reporters, but we know we have educators out there that may not be appropriate for, and that's why we have our, you know, that's why I create positions like myself and equal opportunity and equity officer like Gia, those things are created because it's just these things happen. But do we get the, the right reports? Are we, you know, are people really telling their, their educators, like, that's not cool, like, stop doing that? It doesn't happen. And so we ha as a mandated reporter, we got to make sure that we're able to have the, those tough conversations sometimes with our colleagues and say, like, look, can't do that. Um, so I, I would go wildly, and I, I mean, uh, yeah. So no, Travis, um, uh, Travis. Then it's Wadley. Then it's TJ, and then we'll get to uh, closing up because um, I know it, it, this is we, we're we're going we're going in. But again, um, if anybody, I'm not leaving, but I just let anybody know that you don't have to stay on and, and go. But I want to make sure anybody that needs to be heard, I I will definitely stay here and to uh, listen. Um, uh, so go ahead, Travis. Are you still here, Travis? Hopefully. Oh no, did you leave Travis? Yeah, Travis may have left. I'll read his statement um, here. Um, he says, my father was an auto, um, was an auto uh, school owner and always said in class to everyone, when pulled over, take on the keys um, and put them on the dashboard um, and, and both hands on top of the steering wheel and um, say, yes, sir, no, sir. And any an officer asked. Only uh, now, looking back, I can see that he was trying to save lives in a way that I didn't understand uh, back then, uh, when I was an ignorant and DWB um, or D, you know, whatever. Is that driving while black? All right. Um, uh, Wadley. Hey. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share a few from a, a few different perspectives and di different age groups. Um, and, and going back to the topic of education and, and the push to get more um, people of color, uh, more in, and I think specifically men of color. But um, so just to kind of give you a few scenarios, when COVID-19 hit, uh, 
I am in Dartmouth. I'm a Dartmouth resident. My children are in Dartmouth Public Schools. Um, my wife is an employee for Fall River Public Schools. Um, when we went into quarantine mode, Dartmouth Public Schools, the, the first push was how can we get technology out um, to our students, which is great and which is fair. And, you know, not too many were actually in a position where there was a need of technology. Uh, meanwhile, my wife and her team in Fall River Public Schools, uh, their main concern is how are we going to provide food um, and, free, and free lunches now that our students aren't able to come in. You know, so, so that right there just shows you right from the get go, uh, elementary age, where my children are now in a position where, you know, they're, they're being part, they're part of a group um, where, you know, they're, they're their priority is already, you know, your your future and your ability to succeed and, and to move forward um, versus in Fall River Public Schools, your priority is can you survive? Um, so that's one example of, of um, the difference, the, the unlevel playing field, if you will. Um, second example, I was a math teacher at Keith Middle School, um, New Bedford Public Schools, for anyone that's not aware. Uh, and I remember we were talking about colleges one day and I took a survey of my eighth grade math class. And I said, how many of you have a relative currently that is in college? And I remember there was one hand uh, that went up of one relative that was in college. And then I said, well, how many of you have a relative currently that's incarcerated? And almost a half of the class put their hand up. You know, so you're looking at who do you see? What, what's your role model? Who is in your family? Who is your circle? Um, what are you looking at as far as what's ahead for me? You know, now we're looking at middle school age, you know? Um, and then I'll fast forward to my own experience, um, again, sticking in a level of education, but um, I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college. I, I went on to get my master's at Cambridge College and I remember sitting in, in, in my cohort one day looking around um, where there were three males and I was the only male of color in, in the group. And just looking around and feeling like I didn't fit in and was I actually doing the right thing. Um, and just even listening to conversations and listening um, to everybody's lifestyle and, it, and just feeling different and feeling like I had to dig in a little deeper in order to make it through. Um, you know, so I, I, I say all this just to paint a picture of what education looks like. And I think there is, and I'm currently a, a guidance counselor at a local high school. Um, and one of the incentives, you know, and, and Rob and I have talked about this and, and Serge Moniz is involved, um, is men of color, or people of color in general, um, they do need an extra push. They do need extra incentives. They, knew, they do need extra support um, to help them, you know, to get through, to succeed and to be successful. So, um, and I think this is a part where everybody in here in their own circle of influence can help and can participate because I, I know automatically the backlash is there shouldn't be any extra resources for them um, they should be able to get, get the job done just like everybody else, you know? Um, you know, so even those little comments, I, I know we'll get, you know, and then, you know, if, if there's funding involved, forget it. How are you taking money from my child to give to this child? You know? Um, so these are the things that I think we uh, as a whole can play a part of is seeing, understanding why some people do need extra resources. Some people do need extra support. Um, and then, you know, trying to educate people when, you know, when uh, uh, those kinds of opinions come up. Thanks, Rob. And thanks everybody for your time. No, thank you, Wally. Um, that's very, very important. And what Wally just said at the end there is, is, is extre extremely vital. We have like equity agendas, which is now the state, what the state would like for us to, you know, really focus on. 
and all our schools are now ramping up how that looks. But are the right people at the table to have those conversations of what equity truly looks like? And then on top of that, are the questions in our strategic plans are about where is the money? Where's the money going? Are, what grants are we, are we receiving? Um, what resources are being allocated to people that are teaching, um, that are pushing these, um, you know, pushing these uh, agendas forward to make sure that it, because the problem is, is we, you know, like in my position, you'll hear, let's do this. And then you're like, well, it's me and Melissa and I, you got, we have a hundred million things to do. And without resources or extra people or people that are volunteering, it's extremely, it's extremely difficult to make happen. Um, so, and now, you know, so myself and Melissa, we, we do, we wear many hats, just like a lot of you wear many hats and trying to balance it. And it's just not a great model. There's no way that we'll be able to truly impact our communities if we sustain this type of modeling. So when, if you guys are in strategic planning meetings or you are in these type of meetings, talk about funding, you know, ask that question. I think sometimes we get so drawn into like how things work for people of, with different equity issues and, 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 and that's commendable, but then we don't realize that we're not looking at how to attain a grant or how to get extra funding or do things um, and then ask the right people for that. And I think the more people that are really behind that, then the more resources that we can provide. So it is our responsibility to ask as well, because I think sometimes people may not know that, you know, they just, you know, education is something that, that rolls on a bare minimum. And because it rolls on a bare minimum, we, send, we tend to kind of just, just do it as is and it's just not effective and that's why you don't see these changes is because we're just not funded uh, appropriately um amanda you are you still here i know you had something yes i do hello um so just a, a note about some of the things that are happening here in rhode island i live in um east providence so it's like right nearby um so we'll, yeah um, one of the things that did happen, we did have a protest the other day at Kennedy Plaza. And just to make sure that this is reiterated, a lot of the protests are peaceful, but a lot of the hate groups are actually using it as a cover up to loot and to riot. And multiple places were targeted, even like, I, I, I don't know if this is 100% true or not, but I guess there were guns fired even at the um, at the, the local pride buildings too. Um, so it's like it's it's a cover up to kind of is like yes, let's let's go and do this, and they'll just blame the protesters instead. So just again, it's it's not it's a lot of different things are happening right now but I, I think we do need to be reminded a lot of the protests are peaceful a lot of people do want to make change and those voices aren't loud enough so one of the things i definitely think we need to do is make sure that those voices are heard if you hear about it make sure like i forget exactly where it was um there was a um the police officers i forget exactly where it was it ended up being a cookout Instead, what could have been a really bad protest ended up being a cookout between the firefighters and the all, you know, you know Black Lives Matter movement, just sitting down and talking. Um, so we need to hear a lot of those stories. Um, so if you do hear it, um, talk about it. Talk about it to your students. Talk about it to, to faculty. Um, but again, I wanted to bring that up because that's what's been happening here in, in Providence. Um, and make sure that the the voices of, you know, those those really good moments are heard. Absolutely, Amanda, uh, thank you for that, and, and that's very valuable. Uh, I'll share something with you. I had a con I had a conference with several students. Some of them were in um, this meeting because they wanted to look at this format. Uh, the conversation was how can I influence change and make a youth movement and maybe have a youth rally, but have it where it's not exposed to the exterior where you know people can infiltrate their their what the, the messages that they're trying to get across so they're looking at this format right now we spoke about having mayors superintendents of the schools to be part of it but a ton of students from the different high schools colleges that are in our area um, and all be in this one form um, with the same type of format where the students can really lead and speak and really say that we, they want to influence change um, so I, I, and then they say, you know, and the great thing about this is they can put people, hold people accountable um, by, by creating these types of spaces versus it just being 
a loud uh, protest that's there and protests are needed. Trust me, we need protests because it, p these forms are created because of those things. Even me who fight for students of, of different backgrounds all the time, I'm not always doing forms like this because I have other work I'm doing and I can even get lost in the fray and, um, and they kind of put me back into like, hey, we need this thing to get done. And I'm like, yeah, let's, let's do it. So um, look out for that type of stuff. But let, very important um, message there, Amanda, is listen to the students. Understand that they are that change. Some of our generations are damaged. But I mean, if you look at the protests that are out there, there are people that are hijacking it. But this is the most diverse group of protesters I've seen. Um, and some people like it and some people don't. And I, I, I tend to understand why. But it's, you did not see, you know, even five years ago when they were doing this stuff on Mike Brown, you didn't see this, it, the groups weren't this diverse. So there is some change. Our young generation can teach us something. We may complain about them, but they, you know, my daughter, we had to talk to her about going out and protesting be, just because they are compelled to do so and they want to do so and they want to do things um, and let them be the voice. I tell them to lead from different ways. Don't just lead in one way, find different ways where, you know, sometimes I think as people, we play checkers. And then meanwhile, these people are in higher position are playing chess with us. We have to start um, understanding, hold people accountable and play chess and, and figure out ways that we can maneuver um, where we can affect change. So no, I appreciate that comment, um, a statement there, uh, Amanda. Um, TJ? Hi. Um, yeah, well, I kind of, you know, thought of, thought of a lot of different um, things to talk about throughout this. Um, got, definitely got a lot of ideas, a lot of stuff, um, you know, I wrote down and I'm personally going to go through. Um, and I also wanted to take a second to thank um, the people who, who shared their experiences today, because I think that you know, those experiences are, those experiences touch people a little bit differently than, you know, just state, just, just stating facts. And um, so, you know, it's definitely those, that's definitely necessary and it's, it's tough. It's definitely tough, but, um, you know, that's, that's what's going to lead to, um, to change because I think that, that opening eyes like these people's eyes up to the to the hurt that it's caused on on surface level and on many deeper levels to the like to the way that um sorry i'm like kind of losing my words here um you know the way our communities are set up like why like the like why low income communities exist in and things of that nature are are not really talked about and are definitely very prominent in in solving this problem um, because it's i I personally believe that what's um you know the real way to solve this problem is to it, re attack it at its root really and the and to um go back earlier to um what Wadley was saying about extra funding um I think that that like when that comes into play this that also plays an important part in in understanding why that extra funding is needed because someone might initially think well why are they getting more money in their district um than than mine but I'm sure that if that person that perfectly rational person understood you know people in this community a lot of their earlier family members their grandparents were subject to redlining which didn't allow them to um you know buy a house at a young age like maybe their grand grandparents were able to um and i i think that Op sort of opening their eyes up to up to the real problems and and how they reflect today is is a major key in um in solving this problem 
Thank you, uh, TJ. It's, it's really important. TJ is uh, one of our student leaders in the um, Multicultural Center and an athlete at the school. And so um, hearing your voice is also important. Um, some of the other students that are here, your voices are important. It can't just be us either. And um, we're here to collaborate. I try to collaborate as much as I can. Sometimes I give them a little bit too much to do and they're like, what are you doing, guy? But it's one of those things to kind of just try to insert them so they can kind of get involved and really be that change because if it's coming from them, um, uh, their other students can sit there and say, you know what, yeah, I need to stand up. What we're seeing from the, you know, that's, you know, we want to take away from, yeah, the, the, the murder that we saw is awful and the looting is awful. Um, rioting is not, is scary. Um, the police that are out there is everything. All this stuff is a scary moment for us in America. What's beautiful though, is the people that are here. We all look different. You can see us in all of our different boxes and, and you can see, you know, how we represent, we look differently. Um, and that's what makes us unique. And that's, you know, uh, I'm not gonna get into religion, but um, we're, you know, we're all here um, for reasons to, to really impact and, and live uh, the best life that we can. And we got to, and we as educators, students, colleagues, friends, like, as I said, we are responsible to make sure that our neighbor feels welcomed um, and that, that people are um, impacting, we're impacting change where we can, we're, we're, we're designing outlets that can really, you know, create paths for people to really become who they want to be and shame on anybody who wants to take that away from someone um, because it is your right to be who you want to be and to do the right thing I think is hard for some people because you just haven't been taught. In today's forum we heard people that have changed a little bit from their original perspective. Um, in today's forum we heard people cry about experiences that they had. Um, in this forum we heard experiences, we looked at outcomes these spaces are built in order for us to change and really make a change in the world. And I really appreciate everybody that's in here, everyone that took the time, everyone that really, you know, that really just, I mean, again, we're three hours, almost three hours into this. We scheduled it for literally an hour and a half plus another half hour. And that's because this is real. People really care about this. Um, and I know as a leader, um, my pledge is to make sure that I keep fighting for students. I've always done that. Um, Doris earlier spoke about uh, movies and Lean On Me and Stand and Deliver were two movies that I saw that actually kind of triggered my mind about standing up for other people and, and being that, 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 that voice. And it's always been in the back of my head and two movies that I love, um, but they're real. Um, and they, sometimes these are realities that we don't know. And it's okay if your reality is different than mine or somebody else. That's okay. Let's try to create this change and, and get ourselves to, you know, a better Bristol, Bristol County and better, better nation. Um, i like to close up if uh, anybody has anything that they would um, want to share. If not, we'll, we will close up. I just want to kind of give you next steps. The next steps is you will, will receive um, several, um, you'll receive publications from us, emails about the things that we are going to do. Um, I don't think tonight anyone's gonna figure out how to create this change immediately, that's fine. That's for us to work together and find out. So shoot me an email, um, wanna have a meeting, that's fine. If you wanna do it in your own area, look out to, um, look out to the things that are, um, that are important to your areas that we can maybe influence change, whether that's a policy, um, a procedure that's there, um, how we recruit our students, how we retain our students, um, or even how we recruit and retain our faculty and staff. I, I was um, motivated this year to start, to help start um, what's called an employee resource group that is, you know, yesterday helped me big time. It was employees of color that we have a group and we heard our stories and we spoke for a long time yesterday, just like this. Um, and it's just to understand that these, we are creating spaces. There are people who care. You're not in this alone. Um, your heart's in the right place, but find, you know, this is time for us to collaborate. And this can't just be over for you to feel good and then say, all right, I'm better now. And then forget about it next week. Find act. And this is why I'm sending out these emails. So you can have actionable items, things that you can work. On. I don't know if they're going to work for you. There are things that have worked for me and others. But you find what's you you kind of navigate through it and see what is going to best fit 
you and what you're doing as a student, faculty, family member, um, police officer, wherever you, wherever you stand, nurse, doctor, president of a school, use things that are gonna help you so we can elevate each other. And I think if we continue to do that as, as a group, as people, we can be that change. Imagine if they look at our area and they say, this area gets it and what's happening to look at what these students are doing and accomplishing because we all got together to do that. And that would be special. And that's something that no one can take away from you if you're able to create that change. Um, I thank you guys um, for everything. Um, I want to thank the interpreters we went over. I appreciate you guys doing that. Um, and uh, again, uh, uh, Wally, thank you for making sure I said that. <laughs> um, and again, and Melissa, we went over. I appreciate you. We're trying to navigate it. I hope I did not miss anybody's information. I couldn't get to every text because I'm getting private messages and things. So I really, really apologize. Um, July 2nd is our next thing. Um, so hopefully I can see you guys on July 2nd. Um, and that would be race and uh, criminal justice in America. It would be, and then I will send some information about that and we will we'll have local police and also um, our public um, police at Bristol will be part of this uh, panel and workshop that we're gonna have. So again, love everybody. Thank you guys. Thanks for staying on and uh, have a great, great night. And if you need me, you know where I'm at and offer your help too. Shoot me an email if you can offer some help somewhere um, and let's make change. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank, Thank you. you, Rob. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Hey Rob. Yes, sir. Yeah, this was this was excellent. Thank you for putting this on. Oh no, and I appreciate I can tell this call this coalition as it goes. We have we have to spit the facts. We have to because it's 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 ongoing. It's years and years and years from our existence. Obviously, it's four hundred some years of captivity. But from when we came onto this earth, like you, you and I in eighties and everything that we've endured. We have to give more experiences, even if applying for jobs and the things that we shouldn't be doing, that because of fear, we have to do it. Of this, like applying, like I said to you yesterday about applying for jobs and putting on that application what you look like and the fear of knowing that if you put that you're black, you're not gonna get a call. And how, perp and how like I did when I applied for the Bristol position, I purposely didn't put what I look like because I want to be judged of all my credentials. So when I walked in that door, you see what I look like. And it's, and it's just like, but we shouldn't have to do that. I shouldn't have to, I should be able to like put what I look like and you're gonna, and you, and I fit your description of what you're looking for in, a, in, a, in an employee, but it doesn't work that way. And that's, and that's, and that's one of the examples of privilege and just prejudice and racism like across the board the whole system is just because we don't know who's on the other end filtering and giving up those opportunities like we have that mentality that i should have to hide what i look like when i'm working for something towards and i feel like that i'm a qualified individual for this job you know it, it's so funny that you you said that because this it, it's going I knew I'm using the word compel. If you guys know me, if I, if I hear a word once, I use, tend to use it for a whole week. So I'm using, I've used, this, the word of the week is compelled, right? So I was compelled to do all these things. But um, <laughs> I looked at my, myself and my career path and I told you that I see people applying for jobs that have master's degree, but I'm always told that if I'm gonna get a job, I need a PhD and all that, and which I am going to pursue and I'm pursuing this fall, I'm already in the program. The problem, the problem is it's like I told, you know, I sat back and just let people tell me what I can do and positions will open up and I don't even apply. And I know I'm very capable of doing it. And then I see people that are going for these and I'm like, I could have done that. You know what I mean? I could do that. I, I, I know my, what my capabilities are, but it's almost like embedded in me. And even as a leader, there's still levels that I have to kind of, and so I told myself no more, like, I, I don't care. I'm a, if I, if I want something, I'm just going to go for it. 
I'm not going to let other people tell me and regardless of what they qualify me as needing to have in order to do that. And believe it or not, it's not coming from people that are white. They're telling me the people, the people of color saying I need these things in order to do it. So it's even my own people that are telling that are because we navigate a certain way. And I'm like, oh, maybe I'm a little different, you know? And when I first took over the, the center, the center was really a one-on-one, um, it was really a one-on-one type of um, center. And with it being a one-on-one center, um, sorry, I had something here going up the lyric. There was um, a one-on, it, 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 I had a vision that needed to change, that we needed to be a little bit more nimble. We needed to make sure we're more interactive. We got to, has to be a community. And so it completely took one style and one thought process that the school didn't think would be successful and, and turn it to what it should be. Um, and we're starting to see things move along um, in that direction. And, but it was my own, I didn't, but people told me that it wouldn't work my way because it hasn't worked at Bristol. And we've, I mean, this, this past year, our, our goal was to increase, was to increase, um, participation by 5%. We increased it by 93% this year. So by the data that we were taking. So the, and then you sit back and you're like, you know, why is that? Because we're innovative. We move, we look at things that we want to do. And sometimes we hold ourselves back and you're right. You, you want to pop in and not say who you are. Unfortunately, when you look at my name, you see my last name, you know, I'm not, you, you already know that I can't hide my last name. You know, I have to apply a particular way um, because it's just, you know, as soon as you see Delalu, you looking and you think it's French, immediately you look it up, it's, it's Haitian. And then so people right away would know that, you know, what my ethnicity is. So unfortunately I can't do that. But I look at, you know, Bristol and things that I've done in here and I'm like, how can I, you know, influence and, and let people know that I'm more than just, you know, people for a long time just call me a, um, the athletic director. I'm not the athletic director. I'm not coach, but I'm not the athletic director. But that's, again, it's this mindset of where people place me. When I was working in secondary ed, everyone thought I was a security guard, right? Or, or gym teacher. And I'm like, wait a second. I know I'm, a, I'm an athlete. It is true. I played college sports. I did these things. But it's these things that really, um, there's really these things that oppress yourself and you don't even recognize that people are saying, and it might be just and it might not be purposeful, but it, it has happened. And now I've told myself, no, I'm not going to just shake my head when somebody says something. I'm like, no, this is who I am. This is what I'm striving for. And, and let it be known because it's, 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 it's unfortunately, it's a space. You're right. There's a space that you get yourself trapped in. And then we are just who we are. And I'm more than just the diversity. I mean, you know how many programs in our school that we've been involved with, with financial aid, advising, all these different pieces. It's, it's something that we want to continue to build on. We are, we're well educated in those areas. Our area is so well educated in those areas because our students, our first gen don't have it, didn't really have a clue going through it. So we had to learn everything. So every time they have these, these beginning trainings, we just know everything. And I'm like, wow, we, we, we've kind of been through it. So we need to make sure we're creating that on these campuses where people that are helping these students are trained and have an understanding of these areas in order for that to happen. But it also very empowering because a lot of it it'll, it'll empower you to want to create change, look at jobs, and then possibly create them for others as well. So, but thank you for that. You're, you're spot on. Rob, if I can just say as a person who is sometimes struggling to kind of find my voice, I think forums like this are really empowering because you are a black man who's working in higher education and who, who is speaking up. And I think that, yeah, oftentimes you do, someone mentioned earlier, you're getting in the room and looking around and I think it was Wadley who mentioned like, um, you know, you notice these things. And I think that that's true of all of our experiences, even at Bristol. So I think it's great to have these conversations and seeing, Seeing people of color in these leadership roles really go a longer way than others may assume or may know. So it's not just about the students, it's about others who are trying to move up within higher education who are equally impacted. So thank you again. I think this was really great. Well, thank you again. Thank you guys for coming. It just, it's powerful. Like I, I just feel like this is a great point and now we just can't drop the ball. That's the thing is what's next. Um, so you guys will be hearing from me, ERG, um, Gia, we, we would love to have you be part of that. 
um, and, and, and your experiences, you know, as attorney and, and equal opportunity officer and doing those things. We'd love to have you be part of that and be part of the voice and, and um, man, I'm just, it's just, I need, I, I, we need, we need this to happen. Um, you know, I'd love people to come by, um, you know, and come by the center, call me. You know. Rob, I had high expectations and you exceeded them. Thank you, I appreciate it. it was Rob, quick question. Sorry, Gia, you all, you're all done? Didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm never done. Okay. <laughs> Rob knows. <laughs> Rob, quick question. You had mentioned before that um, we will be receiving more information and stuff. Is everybody who is registered here or do we need to go and sign the petition first? So if you were if you were registered here, you get okay. that information. All right, thank you. That that gives me the permission. And then you and if someone doesn't want it, we'll put a clause like if you don't want to receive anything, just send it to me. Okay. Yeah. But thank you everybody, very much. everybody that's here will be able to get that. So when the next invite happens, I'll still have it open to the public, but the next invite will be for will be for um, everybody here if they want to attend. If they don't want to attend, that's fine. We'll try to record all this and send it out to everyone. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Rob, it's Wendy. I My video is not available, so that's why I didn't turn it on today. But I have a question, um, it, 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 not only for myself, but for anybody who might ask me, what is the best way that they could get guidance on participating? So I would probably, you know, again, I think there's many ways. The best way of participating is, and if they would like to take part in this, um, we are going to put out um, the series and what they are going to be. So if you, you, if you or your area have expertise that you can help out in some of this, so if it's healthcare, so that goes from some of our healthcare departments, if it's social, I mean, criminal justice, so some of our criminal justice departments, if it's business and, and financial literacy, so some of those departments, if it's um, uh, recruitment and retention of students, um, if it's an inequities in education, that can be anyone. They could talk about their areas that have a lot of inequities that they're trying to change. Um, you know, there's some barriers for, for things like, uh, there's some barriers like in financial aid. Call me, you know, we can talk about these barriers and figure out ways. I've, we found ways, we still don't have all the answers. We just do what works for us again, being a, a, a small, a very small department, but it's really worked for a lot of our students. And sometimes it's not even so much being extra creative. It's like just making a folder and having something available for them when it goes a long way. It could be that simple. Um, but if they want to be part of the curriculum for these, um, for these uh, sessions, I op I'm, open, I'm open to it. If students want to be part of these sessions, and you know, and they're part of that. You know, if they are, want to do it like as an as an intern or something that they can learn or help design it. You know, um, we're more than welcome. We want to be as inclusive as possible. Community partners, if community partners want to be part of these sure. series, I'm going to ask several of them. But I don't know all the community partners. I'm only going to ask my network of people. So I want my network of people. I'm going to ask them first. But if you you know someone is watching this when this gets delivered and then they get through this. Um, I would want them to please volunteer and ask me how we can help. Um, Christian McCloskey is not here right now, but um, for MLK, they were part of that, helped us to change. Our program has changed so much just from them adding their students, gave, triggered so much other things that we started doing. That is important. So even though you might have a small little part, just your idea or thought might trigger an idea to really help. Um, and then early when Laura was saying that all those things that you were taking into in consideration as far as your your studies and that right there is you have a wealth of knowledge shoot me that knowledge because there might be things that I haven't even thought of um, because I'm only speaking from my lens and my perspectives and things that I have um, but the more of us the better I always look at pipelining and the, the way I say about it is 100% of your effort this is from Robert Kiyosaki, and um, if you ever rich dad, poor dad, if you ever get a chance to read it, what I've taken from that is 100% of your effort is no greater than 1% of 100 people. So you, the more people we have out there that are doing good things, we can create that change. So let's try to develop that if we can. So hopefully that answers it, Wendy. I don't have all the answers, but if they contact me my, and Melissa, 
we'll keep that communication moving and we'll try to figure out a way to make it work. Thank you so much. That is very helpful. Thank you. Anything else, anybody? All right, All right guys, I appreciate it. I think, the, I think Rebecca had a comment. Oh, Rebecca? No. No, no, no. No, no comment. <laughs> and and uh, Rebecca, are you a student at Bristol as well? Yeah, we were talking about something before, but it, it's really sort of, it, it's not really applicable now, but. Um, um she was a student at bcc yes um but but i did want to say something about my own experience briefly um my um i was i did have an experience that i got pulled over um i was following all the rules i put my hands up on the steering wheel and you know the officer came to the car and i explained that i couldn't hear i'm deaf i can't hear and he continued to talk to me and said how can deaf people drive um and and i told the police officer that oh, it's hard to see i'm sorry He said he saw the police officer talking to another police officer. And it was happening. Something about him, yeah. And luckily, my friend was there and said and explained that I was deaf. Um, and it's very, very difficult for deaf people when they're trying to answer. Um, did you get this, Cheryl? I'm no, having no. He's too far away, really far away it's very small i'm really sorry um so there were two young boys who were deaf yeah come a little closer to the screen thank you <laughs> yeah so i'm sorry no oh. interpreters sorry so <laughs> he said it's fine so there were two boys with their mom and every morning they would she would drop them off at school um with sign i love somehow you there was a young boy and signed, signed this sign to his mother to say i love you and the police officer thought it was a gang sign that he was part of a gang because they used this same hand symbol in a different way. And this young boy was shot. And he was shot by, because he was telling his mother, I love you, on his way to school. And, um, and three days later, there was a deaf man who was signing and he was also shot. Um, and they're just, these are just some examples of what, um, in addition to being black, being deaf and black. So I have experienced many of these same situations where police officers don't understand that we're deaf in addition to just being black. So, um, you know, I know that that's the way it is and we have to be very careful and really watch what's happening when anywhere, be very aware of our, of our surroundings because our hearing is broken. You know, we have to base everything on what we can see. Um, and we have to be very aware of data that are around us. Um, that's, but you said it's so important. Um, very tough, I, difficult for, yeah. for deaf people. It's very difficult. Um, it is, and and it's like um, you know, I have this vision of 
African people coming to America as slaves. And then they were split and now they go, we try to come together and now we're being encouraged to separate again. All colors are beautiful. We're beautiful. And if you don't like whatever color you're seeing, then you have to deal with it. Because they're all out there and they're beautiful colors to me. Any color you want, we're all out there. And it's all and good. God made all of us. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. That that that's so powerful. And um, not that this frames it or or anything. Um, you know, as a coach, I learn a lot about the deaf community. One of my players was deaf, so I had to you know really catch up and really start learning, because again, remember about privilege. We, you know, we talk about white privilege. We don't understand that just privilege is just being us and having that understanding. But I guarantee when they're doing police training, they're not talking about what happens if you pull over a person that is, you know, that is deaf or hearing impaired or visually impaired or, or have different disability, uh, abilities or disabilities. And I think that is something that really needs to happen. And perhaps yes, I wish there would be more education for the police. Um, because they really um, have a certain stereotype about deaf people, you know, and I'm just, you know, there's such a small percentage of police officers who have deaf family or knowledge of deafness, a very, very small percentage. So most are really ignorant about the deaf community. And that, that ignorance is something that we have to, you know, your your passion and, and the way you explained everything needs to, be, needs to be heard by others. And I think, you know, there might be an opportunity to link in with me so we can talk about these type of things and maybe we can create programming that is valuable to others that, that, ha that are, look like us, but, you know, have different abilities. Fine. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. But I did also want to introduce myself. My name is Lamont Williamson, and I'm from South Carolina originally, and I moved to New Bedford about two years ago, and I've been coming to BCC in the adult education program. And I'm really, really pleased to meet all of you. Really pleased. Nice to meet you, uh, Lamont. And um, again, our multicultural center, I know this is a tough time. We are located in the um, Building G, uh, in Fall River, and we're um, on the second floor. Um, but we do a lot of virtual um, drop-in sessions and things. So if you shoot us an email, um, and we know ahead of time, we can set up the, the room so that way we can accommodate you and we can kind of get the information and, um, and really, you know, really build from there. I'd love to, uh, your, the, to take your ideas and, and really run with some of them. <coughs> and anytime you want to get in touch with me, um, you can uh, get in touch with me through Julie, um, oh. who's in the, um, um, the ODS. 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 Um, and she can get in touch with me anytime. Um, she knows how to reach me. Yeah, I work with Julie a lot. Julie is awesome. So yeah, this would be easy. And she's, I know she's a great advocate. Yeah. Man, this is powerful, people. I tell you, it, this is powerful. I, I don't even, I, I can't even quantify it. I can't even explain it. Um, you know, but let's, let's, you know, be the change. Let's do something. If, let me know. Um, if you need me, I'm here. Um, I appreciate, again, I thank you guys for going over time. I know, um, but it's, it's needed. And again, nothing but love. And I'll see you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Be in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Rob. And uh, Jessica, don't think I didn't see your origami. Uh... <laughs> I saw I that. can't. I always have to be that person, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Jessica worked with me at New Bedford uh, Volk, and she would always make me origami things. So, and now she does that as a person, so. Oh, I had 
I, this really, it filled my heart when my heart was feeling really depleted. So I, I, I'm so grateful to be included in this and I'm definitely looking forward to um, more of it. No, thank you so much. And thanks for being part of it. Thanks for the support. You know, but all right. We're going to go because Melissa is going to be like, you know, you keep talking. So I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to let everybody. No, talk. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, this is incredible. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much.